Hello, friends, and welcome to the most glorious of events, the Movie Mavericks Podcast. This outstanding program is hosted by two fine gentlemen, Jason and Trevor. Now make it so. MovieMavericks.com. Hey, now, everybody. Welcome to episode 381 of the Movie Mavericks podcast. I'm Trevor Anderson. Send you over to Jason Rugard. He's got a rundown for us. On tonight's show, we will be discussing Black Adam, Halloween Kills, Munsters, The New Hellraiser, a lot of horror films on there, as well as the trailers for Creed 3, Avatar, and the new Christmas story. A legacy sequel, I guess, from 1983 to now. So a lot of stuff to discuss on tonight's show. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And um, let's just jump right into here. It's been a while since we talked. It's always good to talk to you, my man. Always good to hear from you. I got some <laughs> trivia for you, though. And I know that you are you say you're not very good at trivia, right. but you're fairly good. And this is, I can't say Oof. it's recent or not recent trivia, but it's, it's trivia that I think you'll get. Okay? All right. <laughs> what is the only movie... Since 1985, to be number one at the box office on Labor Day and Memorial Day. Do you know? That's May 25th, and that's the end of September. Uh, or I'm sorry, end of August. I mean, I don't know. Unless it's really recent, I could make a guess. I, eh, um, just give it a guess. Give it the old college try. I don't know. What was uh, how, what was uh, Top Gun? How, how long did that one last? That's right. Top Gun Maverick. That's what I thought. Well, I was Un- wondering if it lasted fucking that believable. <laughs> well, it was in and out, wasn't it, towards the end there? It, went, it dropped out of number one and then went back to number one. Yeah, it was. I think it was like um, in the, hovering bit, in the top so. three. And this, you know, a yeah. lot of circumstances had to come together. Black Adam being pushed to October. There wasn't really a tentpole release after Nope. So there was you know, a, a huge dead period at the box office, and it, it found a way to number one, although I think it beat Bullet Train that weekend. So a hell of a feat by Top Gun. Obviously, it's box office run. We watched the box office figures fairly closely uh, you know, over the years, you and I, and this has been a, 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 the trajectory of that film was <laughs> unprecedented, what it over did the in years. theaters. I, it, I don't anymore. <laughs> but you keep it. You know what the number one film is typically at the box office. I'm sure, or at least like to what, some degree. But I don't even actually don't even know what's playing for like the last few months because there's just nothing. It's there's been a been, dearth um, of options. Really, not much. Yeah, it's, it's well, it's, it's there were bad. things out there, but I wouldn't say they were enough to pay top tier prices. Not right to now, go to the theater for. Yeah, there's there's movies playing, of course, and you can go see them. But I don't. Um, nothing that I was excited about. I should say. Maybe I, I, not for the pricing. Although I do have to say, yesterday I saw a matinee screening of Black Adam, and it cost me eight dollars. I thought I got transported back yeah. to nineteen ninety seven. I don't know what the fuck. I was like eight dollars. <laughs> are you sure? I mean, the convenience fees typically yeah. are about half that. So um, that's why you got to you got to go early, man. Yeah, it was a two o'clock show. It was you know, you it was the guy, early. the unemployed, Only two playing o'clock? hooky Come guys on. were in there. <laughs> I used to go at like eleven, ten, ten, eleven uh, back when we had, when uh, the movie pass was out. Oh, those are good ones. Yeah. I also we I used, used to, to go, go to the 10.30 yeah. p.m. ones, and no one would be, it'd be pretty deserted. I'd usually have theaters to myself, which is kind of nice. You know, I used to do that too, but then, uh, uh, well, you know, 20 years ago, I used to do that, obviously. But uh, but then, yeah, Movie Pass came around, and it was so much nicer to go at like 10 or 11 in the morning to the first showing, uh, f- basically for free on the Movie Pass, right? And then, uh, and then you had the whole rest of the day still. <laughs> you I come agree. out, and you're like, oh, my, my day is still good, and I've seen a movie. Like, I'm. <laughs> I don't know, it, was, it was the right way to start off my day, you know? Do you know what I would do with that movie pass is I would look at the first show time of a movie and go, okay, I'm going to catch that. And inevitably, I'd be like, oh, I got to do this, this, and this. I'll catch the next one. And then before you know it, it's the last screening of the day. And it's like, I've missed four other ones. I might as well hit this one. So I would just kept pushing it off all day long. But um, I hear what you're saying. I mean, seeing a movie, although I saw there's a movie theater around here that caters to a older crowd, I'll say. And they have an early screener, at least they did pre-pandemic at like 9 a.m. And I got, I convinced my old hmm. man to see Creed, the first one years ago, uh-huh. and he wanted to catch the earliest showing possible because he's like, he wants to get in, get it over, and say he did it. You know what I mean? He wants to move on with this day. So I told him, oh, it'll be over by, you know, we go see the yeah, 9 o'clock, over by 11.30. <laughs> that, that movie was like assaulting at 9 a.m. The fucking, the, the loudness in the, the previews even was like, I'm not, my brain was not ready for that much stimulation at 9 a.m. 
Yeah, that's true. That can be the the other um, bad part about I think a, a movie in in the morning. You're right. Sometimes it is a bit much to sit there and and try to take in the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although, do you find? I mean, as I I've as I gotten older, I go to bed a little bit earlier, which is just sad because I used to be such a dedicated night owl. But even then, I would fall. I would nod off on late movies. Uh, to, if they've got around one o'clock, I'm starting to kind of nod off, especially if we're in a dragging well, third yeah, act of a that's movie. That's relatively late, though. Yeah, but in yeah. the the afternoon showings, I I never would not off. I would just get bored I mean, in my best, seat. The best late night movie I saw would have to be the Mothman Prophecies, and I remember, uh, and and that's kind of a freaky movie to see in a theater. It's it's not so scary any anymore, but it was back then, and I saw it in the theater. And when I walked out, the, of course, the place was empty. You know, at night, hell yeah, there's no one there, and there's no one in the parking lot and everything. And that was pretty scary. <laughs> you know, you just uh, brought I thought up the Mothman for sure. I was going to meet the Mothman. I thought I was going to be there. <laughs> I think that you might be the only one that have a, has a positive reaction to that film. A lot of people saw that movie on yeah. DVD. And it didn't play as well in a theater, but I saw it in a theater too, and I liked it. I didn't see it with you, but I did see it in a theater. A movie that I watched recently, I rewatched recently, I should say, that I saw in a theater years ago when it first came out that was very effective. That's still a good film, but didn't wasn't as effective. Was Mimic. That really played yeah, well in a theater too. Uh, with with the sound and the I just I remember that movie kind of mm-hmm. creeping me out and then I rewatched it recently in the last month or so and it didn't have quite the same impact as it did when I saw it years ago. It's relatively old, yeah. It's and that is a movie that if you see a, a lot of movies, if you watch them in the theater, are just better, I guess. Maybe because it's like an attention thing, it really uh, holds your attention better and puts you like in the space or whatever you're watching, right? Versus like when you watch stuff at home, you're kind of more relaxed. It's like you're in your home <laughs> more than you are in the movie sometimes. I don't know. Another old movie but, that uh, played well in the theater yeah. that didn't get a lot of love but now has seemed to be re-appreciated is Event Horizon. Uh, I guess, yeah. That movie's just uh, gross. <laughs> it, but this, it played very well in the theater with the soundtrack and the shot. I mean, there's a lot of jump scares sure. on the soundtrack mo- itself. Mo- yeah, most horror movies are, will, will do that. Yeah. Play better. I mean... Makes sense. Well, you guessed the trivia right. I'm proud of you, my man. That's it's been a while, and uh, you nailed that one. So well done, and kudos to that. So let's talk a few bits of movie news here. One, Father Stew, Mark Wahlberg's faith-based film that about the boxer turned priest, came out in April, coincide with Easter. Did about 20 million here. Now it's available on Netflix. Have you watched this yet? Yeah, I like Father Stew. I have not watched it yet, but I'm in luck, apparently, because they've recut the movie from an R rating to a PG-13, and they're re-releasing it in theaters on Christmas. It's going to be titled Father Stu Reborn in an effort to get more money out of people. So what? why would anybody watch this? this is, I'm serious. Why would anybody go to a theater to see something in a PG-13 format um, that's readily available right now. And does that just signal you think that they totally fucked up in the handling of this film from the jump, that it should have just been PG-13? I mean, I haven't seen it. So is the R well, rating I'll tell you necessary? Right now, the R rating is just because it's real life. No, this doesn't. This plays like a, like a, a normal movie. It doesn't really play like some R-rated movie, right? There's nothing... Um, even that I can think of, there's nothing insane in it or anything really. So too language bad. or language. same situation, there's sexual situation, drug situation, stuff like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, I would ask, I would say people watch the movie. I think, you know, I would have no problem with 13 year olds watching this movie. Really, it's not. There's nothing in it that would be like that I would think inappropriate. I, it's a really good movie. It's a really uplifting movie. It's a very religious movie. Um, but it's about real life, you know. And this guy was had a rough life and was a rough character, you know, and turned his life around. And I, so I don't, so does it deserve an R rating? Sure. But it's not like some, some R rated, like drug induced crazy movie or something like that. You know, I'm curious how much footage they're going to be cutting. If they're going to add anything to it, what exactly they're going to do. When I saw it was titled father's Stew reborn. I thought, wow, they're already push, pushing so out weird. like a, a direct to DVD sequel or something. And then, uh, or, or a I documentary, just, that's but so weird. Yeah, no, I, I thought that. I can understand, a, like, I can understand the Deadpool stuff that they do with that, but wh- I, what the hell is going to happen with this? What do they think is going to happen? Yeah, there's not going to be guess another maybe, flood of people. Maybe the idea is churches will go. Maybe that's the idea. 
they didn't the first time. So I'm curious to see if I had a PG 13 rating, maybe, maybe that was the issue or maybe they know something we don't know marketing wise or something. Yeah. Maybe they've done a lot of research and that's, that's I mean, the remember case. Churches I know that went to go see passion of the Christ and that was not rated PG 13. <laughs> Do you remember the screening we were in and there was crying kids in there? I mean, it was, that was like a horrific experience. Yeah, so, so I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, well, really, I don't get that at all. Wahlberg self-financed the film reportedly on a $4 million budget. Of course, it costs a lot more to launch it, prints and advertising mm-hmm. and the marketing of it, but it only grossed $20 million. You know, half that goes to theater owners. So the movie may not be profitable yet or may not be that profitable. Uh, so awesome. this might be a, a... But then again, you I have really, to relaunch this. I really recommend it. If, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a really good, solid movie. And like I say, it's an uplifting movie. It's not at all what you expect uh, kind of to happen. And it's, uh, uh, it's a, it's a real-life movie. Good, because I want to watch a good Mark Wahlberg movie. It's been a while since and I've Mark seen Wahlberg a good one. And Mark Wahlberg is good in it, yeah. And he's been on a he's slide lately it. with Infi- Infinite and with Me Time. And some of these other duds he's put out. Spencer Confidential I loved, and I'm ready to watch one that I I really enjoy again. All right, let's talk about the new Avatar film. We'll talk about the trailer later on in the show, but the running time has been released. Cameron has disputed this, saying it's in the ballpark, but not totally specific. The quoted running time that theaters got was three hours and ten minutes, which seems extremely bloated. However, I do want to bring this up because I just found out this bit of information. Another film that we're going to talk about in tonight's show, the trailer for Babylon, Damien Chazelle's new film, Margaret Robbie, yeah. Brad Pitt, listed as a running time of three hours and eight minutes. What in uh, the Currently fuck? theatrical? Theatrical. Three hours? Relaxed. Three hours and eight minutes. I get Jeez. that everything is long form, but you said something to me when I told you about Avatar you we'll said, how could this movies, story support some, that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I mean, think you're right. I, I have don't some know. more questions when we talk, when we do talk about these trailers, I got some more questions for you about okay, that good, kind of shit. Good, like, good. Cause I don't, I'm at a loss for some of the stuff that they're putting out right now. And I think that there's a bit of, um, and, and certainly not at Disney, this is not happening, but at almost all the other, uh, studios, I don't think they know what the hell to put out right now. I think they're scrambling. I think you're right, and I think that there's a lot of there's a weird tug between trusting the old guard and trusting the new guard, and I th- and the, the people coming up, and I think that there's this weird. We'll talk about this in the trailers for some things for tonight, but I think that there's corporate synergy meets nostalgia meets art. You know, I guess a form of artistic integrity, but at this point, I'm seeing. Well, running out of ideas, right? And their ideas right now are reused ideas, and that's. St- not working so much anymore and new stuff is failing because of the people that they've hired. And so now creative is, has basically been completely squashed by the producing side of things and the producers don't know what the hell to do because they're running out of stuff to remake. <laughs> but I'm getting back to at least avatar itself. Has there ever been a James Cameron film that you outright didn't like? I, uh, well, come on. Outright didn't like, wouldn't watch again. Fuck that movie. I can't think of one. I mean, Piranha 2? I mean, mean, pre-1984? This might be it. This might be the one. Piranha 2 is not real. Piranha 2 is not really a... I just wouldn't say that's like a James Cameron movie. It's because it's it's not. It it, has no elements of it. No, no, no. Right. I agree. So from 84 on, I can't think of one James Cameron film that that doesn't have... Rewatch. I've recently to see, rewatched Piranha Two. <laughs> I know you did. You son of a bitch. So, so well, you know. Um, did you watch Piranha no, One though? Yeah. Before that, but, I gotta ask. Um, Hold on. Let me let me stop. Did you watch Piranha be- the original Piranha well, Joe Dante's before uh, that? We, no. Okay, because that's the I good just one. Watched Piranha Two. Yeah. yeah, but I I uh, got a hold of Piranha Two. I just wanted to watch that. Gotcha. There's another. There's two Piranhas or two movies called Piranha. Um, the Joe Dante one, and then there's another one that's not very good. Yeah, the Dante one's fun. Um, that's an older one, too. In any case. In any uh, case, Avatar going to yeah. be over well over three hours, if not longer, and I can't bet against Cameron. Well, look, the Everybody first Avatar does. movie I thought was not very good, so I'm a little confused as to why people would uh, come out and see this, but I don't know. We'll talk about the trailer, I guess. We'll talk about that later. I, For <laughs> record, I really did enjoy the first Avatar. Saw it multiple times in the theater. Thought it was as close to a ride as I've ever seen in a movie theater, and 
the last good thing I saw in 3D, and I haven't seen it. And this will, I will see this in 3D. Well, 3D is dead. So. Yeah, well, no, there's still places around here. There's 4D around here by me. I mean, shit, you can get wind blown in your face and fucking water shot at you. When hey, you're yeah, but it's movie. all a gimmick. I mean, that I've been to those several times. That's a gimmick. The um, the 3D stuff is all basically dead. Yeah, it's all retrofitted. I mean, yes, basically. they still have it because they saw the equipment and things. But I mean, the our, the three dollar theater down here has a 3D screen still. I I, I went and saw uh, the last Spider Man movie in 3D down there. Uh, it's still dead. How is the 3D gone. in that? I haven't seen something in 3D in years. Is, is the 3D improved at all? Is no, it easier to watch? No, it's the same 3D as you've ever seen. Okay, yeah. I guess it's 3D is 3D. Same thing. Yeah, until they do, you know, until they do the 48 frames per second 3D with the laser projectors, uh, I don't give a shit about any of the theater stuff. It's all just crap. They're, they're th- just, they're just going to play the movie on the big screen. That's it. There will be no advancements is what I'm saying. You know, I want more advancements. And James Cameron's not going to do it. Peter Jackson tried; it, that it didn't take hold. They're not put, they're not investing any more money into theaters. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's for shit sure. Especially post pandemic. I mean, we're lucky to even have it. And I just want to say, well, not uh, after the failure of 3D. Now, James Cameron convinced everyone to to um, to again once uh, after they went digital to to buy the real D stuff and do all that stuff, and it didn't pan out. I do want to say R.I.P. to my theater that I grew up going to. It was a mm. Regal Cinema, which was one of the 12 closed across the oh. nation. And this yeah. was a theater that I saw, I mean, stood in line on my dad's shoulders to see Rocky IV, stood in line to see Top Gun as a kid. I mean, just, it was a theater you got dropped off at as a kid, and you saw two movies in a day, played Street yeah. Fighter at the arcade, you know, almost got in a fight, almost got kissed. You know, like, these were the memories where that things happen at. So, sure. R.I.P. to the Crow Canyon Theaters in San Ramon. Several theaters closed here that I have similar memories at. <laughs> it's a goddamn shame. So. One was in the mall, an inside mall that is now no longer exists. And oh man, those are rare. Yeah. The the inside mall theaters, you know, those were, talk about nineteen. Oh, they were amazing. Oh, talk about possibly the shittiest uh, movie watching experience. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But you know what was um, cool about that? My my cousin had one down by him. He lived in Southern California, Southern California. And when you got out of the theater, you could go right into the mall and get the soundtrack if you wanted to. Oh, yeah, you could or, do all kinds of shit. It just it makes sense to have it in the mall. I know. It was it was a perfect. Uh, uh, it was perfect. I would rather have that right now again than anything else. But it was not a very good theater, the quality wise. You know, speaking of theaters in Regal, I, I just shit on them for closing that, but they did, my, my home theater, but they did have a promotion recently, a movie mystery night. I think I was telling you about this, and I wanted to talk about hmm. this on air with you. There was $5 for a ticket. You got a ticket, and they didn't tell you what you were going to see. It was a <laughs> bit of a, of a chance my buddy and I took. <laughs> so it was $5 tickets. We get there. Now, did you at least get to tell, say the time, or did they just have Yeah, it was 7 o'clock on Monday night. So they say, just be here at 7 o'clock on Monday night. By the time I get on there, I go, no one's going to go to this. Wrong. Front row, (laughs) on the corner edge. So I haven't sit with my head. the last guy seated. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I haven't sat with my head perked up in a long time. This is about six weeks ago I went to this thing. So I'm thinking in all my, you know, wisdom, because they're giving me a run time of over two hours, it says. So I'm thinking, okay, it's either going to be Amsterdam because it said something that was going to come out. These are things that hadn't premiered yet. It's going to be Amsterdam. It's going to be this Terrifier <laughs> 2. It's going to be something random that they, they're trying to oh, test for. Oh, you went for. to a, like a screening. Yeah, this is, is a Regal Theater. This is a Regal was Cinema. It a, uh, a, real, a real movie theater. Well, I mean, you can get the tickets. Uh, I'm in several programs. They'll give you tickets to just watch the, the movies before they're... Yeah, no, this wasn't stuff. that. I almost never go because it's always dog shit stuff, but it wasn't one of those. No, okay. this was on uh, the Regal website. I got an email from Regal Cinema's Movie okay. Mystery. In fact, they're doing another one on November 7th. I'm going to be out of town, hmm. but I'm curious what it's going to be that night, although I think that night, I'll tell you what I think it's going to well, be. What, because, what was it? You didn't say this. So <laughs> it starts, and it says, an Apple original production. Oh, fuck. And I go, fuck. And it was the greatest beer run with Zac Efron. Ah. Uh. And Peter Farley's directing it. Now... I actually enjoyed the film because it's not it's something I are we talked about last show something I was already kind of interested in and it turned out to be a, a decent little movie for what it was uh-huh. I don't have Apple Plus so I wasn't going to see it any other way now what I think the next movie is going to be based on that guess is the Will Ferrell Ryan Reynolds holiday movie Spinned or Spirit or some shit like that the Charles Dickens musical 
that they got coming out on Apple TV next week? I have no idea. Yeah, well, no, I, don't, I have Apple TV. Don't care. Don't don't pay attention. Don't know. Well, there you go. Okay. So I, I got nothing for you. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, the, the greatest beer run ever made or whatever just reminds me of, of like the greatest game ever played. Every time you say that title. <laughs> it's way better than that movie to be. Although that's not a terrible movie, but this I enjoyed quite a bit. I, I'm um, sure. But for I, what it was. They, they seem like similar. Um, uh, well, similar films, really, probably in that sense. It was a message movie. I mean, it had a couple laughs and. Peter Frank, Bill Murray's got a little cameo in it, and Russell Crowe's in it, who looks just... who Russell Crowe has now officially morphed into Marlon Brando. He has got to be 300 pounds know, right? in this movie. Honestly, he looks so... He's so large in it that there's a scene where Zac Efron gets in the car and he tells him, get over, I'm driving, and has to squeeze in like an old car, and it looks uncomfortable for him to get <laughs> in the car. You know, like, it's starting to look like the, the, later day Seagal. Is the best way to describe it. Where oh, everything no, looks I, it's like it's inflamed. You know? That's what I was going to say. Yeah, he's like ballooned up. And it's like, because his legs aren't necessarily that big, but his gut and his like boobs are just like, <laughs> I'm just like, damn, man. Like, it looks like you got stung by a bee. Where's the EpiPen? Like, yeah, he looks inflamed. He needs to cut the gluten out. out. I don't know what's going on. Maybe cut the gluten in the beer for right now, just for 100 pounds. But he, I'll, I'll, the sad thing is, because he, when he comes on screen and starts talking, you're reminded immediately of what a good actor this guy is. Because oh, Efron, great, yeah. as, as good as he is in the role, <laughs> is. You know, he's not the same caliber. He's a bit lightweight. Maybe that's just the character he's playing. But Crow comes on and just commands the screen right away. And you're like, that's a fucking movie star. That's what movie stars used to do. You know, just you, you're, you're watching this person because you just, what the fuck are they going to do next? He seemed unpredictable in the role. And it was a good role mm-hmm. for him as a wartime photographer who Efron meets in his uh, trip to Vietnam. I liked the movie for what it was. Interesting experiment. If you're out there and you got a Regal Cinema near you, go on their website. They do these things on occasion, these movie mystery nights. It's kind of fun. You don't know what you're going to see. And it takes the... You know, my buddy and I said, if it's Amsterdam, we're giving it 45 minutes. We're getting the fuck out of here. Same with Terrifier <laughs> too. I don't know where you stand on Terrifier 2. This thing, speaking of box office records, this thing's a juggernaut that keeps defying expectations, building well, each I'll week. I've seen the first one. I'll, I'll, I I'll saw the this first one. one, but this one apparently is sadistic in its violence. Now, I've actually heard that's not true, so I, I'm interested to see it. I have a feeling that there's more hype in this one uh, because of that first one, and it's probably not uh, what everyone's saying it is. I gotta Personal say, experience, I, that's always been what's been for me. I got a review from an 18-year-old who loves horror, and the kid told me, if you think it's 10, dial it up 10. So, and this is a kid mm. who loves that kind of shit. And I'm, I'm not, I mean, you love horror movies. Let's get to the, let's get to the real bottom of this. You love horror <laughs> movies, right? It, it, yeah. Is it the fact that, what is it exactly about the horror movie? Is it the, the tension release? Is it, is it like, because I don't enjoy horror movies that much because I don't really want to be in that world for two hours. Of of uneasiness and fucking dread and, and do you, you like like what exactly is it like attractive to the horror? I, genre? I'm not really scared of the horror movie, so it doesn't really do that um, to me. You know, I'm not not watching it to be horrified. I guess I don't think there's anything that could be in the movies. I've seen all the the bad ones. I don't right, think there's anything right. that it would show up that I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, or not that, past the human. As, as they say with the Terrifier too, yeah, people are fainting and all this nonsense. Right. Um, obviously, no. Right. I mean, I, I just most of the hot, yeah human centipede stuff. It really, the human centipede's not even that bad. None of them are. They really aren't. Uh, so I, I don't know. I've not really seen anything that's really been super bad. I, it's obviously all fake. That's a thing, right? Right. Well, you and I. But for know me, all I don't know tricks. aesthetics. I like the aesthetics a lot. I like the idea of for most horror movies, they're very low budget, so they're creating something out of nothing, and it's, it's a lot of it's atmospheric. I hear you. And uh, and like the direction wise, shot wise, like um, uh, you know, actors, what the actors do, all these things really become very important for like everyone working together to create like a scene that works. Um, so yes, yeah, so I watch uh, um, horror movies mainly for that reason. You know, I watch a lot of low budget stuff in general. That's where I like. I think that's the more interesting movies. That's where the more interesting decisions get made, um, even if they're not as good, obviously, or as polished as the bigger stuff i think they're more interesting i have never seen the 28 days later franchise have you seen both of them yeah danny boyle said today (coughs) danny boyle said today that he's read alex garland's script for 28 days later part three whatever they're going to title it the months i think they're calling it 
he said it's fantastic and he's considering yeah. directing it. Is this a series I should watch? Because I'm not into the zombie. I never saw The yeah. Walking Dead. Is They're this something movies, that I dude. should watch? Yeah, I mean, th- those are really good movies. If I'm going to watch a zombie, I mean, I, I know that as there's like... As far as like, filmmaking goes, yeah, they're really interesting, especially the first one. Um, that was the one on DV, right? Yeah. Like one of the first ones shot on digital video back in the day? Some of it's shot on, yeah, the, the Canon XL1s, I think. Mm-hmm. Some of it because of the way they had to get uh, some of the shots. Yeah, they were stealing shots, I think, um, of deserted streets. So they essentially, had these yeah, they had to move really fast. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting things about the first one, filmmaking-wise, and it's really well put together. And one of the few zombie movies that's that's pretty good. Not only is it good, but it like they try to make sense of it in some way too. So it's not just like nonsense zombies who are having a lot of fun, which I think people get tired of. These are zombies that they have. There's an end to them. Like there's a, there's a point to them, so you understand how they work, um, and you understand how how they end, right? I mean, there's a, the, the title kind of gives it away, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I didn't know so that. I don't so. know. You, you should, I, I'd say I if you're going to watch it. a zombie movie, that one's really fun, you know, like, uh, um, I don't know. It's like a really toned back World War Z. Well, um, I, the thing is, I, I like the insanity one. in the ferociousness. Yeah, so if you like that in that one, then you probably like this one too, because that's in this, but it's toned back from the ridiculousness. Like, but the, the veracity of it, like the, the, the insanity and the, and the crazy stuff is all still here, but it just makes more sense. Like it's not as cartoony. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I will check it out. That I do recall. You know? So if you liked World War Z, I'd, I'd say definitely to give that a shot. I will watch. I, I do like Danny Boyle's directing for the most part. Even his uh, little stuff, I, I quite like. What was the one? Millions with the kids that found the money. Did you ever watch that? Yeah, I, I thought that was cute for what it was. You know, just mm-hmm. a little little experiment by Boyle. Um, but I do think that there was a huge missed opportunity somewhere along the line of Danny Boyle directing that James Bond film. That fell out for whatever reason. Yeah, he would have been a good James Bond director. And I know that they didn't want to go with his script. They chose the script that ultimately became No Time to Die. And my thoughts on that film are on the record. I would have gladly given up the experience of watching No Time to Die to see what Danny Boyle would have done with the character. (laughs) And I just wonder what his script could have been uh, that made them pause, but they commissioned the script for No Time to Die with all of its problems. Um. We'll see what happens next with Bond, but it better be good. It better be good. All right, next, the CBW, or CBW, the WBD, which is Warner Brothers Discovery, which owns the CW. I mean, CW right now is cutting and slashing like it's going out of style. I mean, they're not... CBW is something you get when you eat the gummies, right? That's the CBW? Well, or it's a wart you get when you haven't worn a condom. So it's uh, oh, yeah, it's a venereal disease. I'll take the, I'll take the gummies part. Yeah, well, yeah, nobody wants the wart, trust me. Sometimes you got to take the gummy for the wart. Uh, but this CEO, David Zelaza, whatever this fucking guy's name is, he came in, he's cleaning house at Warner Brothers saying, I mean, they posted like a $3 billion loss this quarter because, you know, they dumped their entire theatrical oh, yeah. slate online in what was ultimately a failed experiment, but was a great experiment for me because I realized that Warner Brothers' entire film slate last year sucked. And I would have gone to the theater and paid well, for yeah. most of those fucking movies. So I'm glad they I got to keep <laughs> that, and they That's just really suckered about, me though. for I mean, HBO most Max. Paramount's mostly Universal. Almost everyone's uh, slate this year has sucked. You know, uh, that's why I think yes. they're they're in a lot of trouble. Everyone is right now. And one of the things I think that the Discovery uh, that CEO is doing is really smart is telling them to knock off this streaming bullshit and make stuff for the theater again. That's where Warner Brothers has always been the crown jewel. I mean, they when they have a big release. Yeah. He said today at a conference, which I wanted to talk about briefly, that there's going to be a re-emphasis on franchises, specifically Superman and Harry Potter. I found that very mm-hmm. interesting because there's been a lot of talk recently, and we'll get into this a little bit with the Black Adam review, but of Henry Cavill and him returning to the role of Superman. He was unofficially cast aside. They were talking about Michael B. Jordan having an iteration, possibly doing an HBO Max show, doing this, doing mm-hmm. that. This guy's saying, fuck that. We have a Superman. The casting isn't the problem. Put this guy in a fucking movie that's going to sell tickets. You yeah. have the quintessential superhero. Before Marvel built up their well, guys, you have the guy uh-huh. who was selling tickets since 1978. Make some money off him. Yeah, and, and I think getting James Gunn back in there. Um, Great idea. Perhaps questionable because I, I think he's had some 
misfires here with the stuff, but in general, he's really good. So I think they're getting their ducks in a line over there at Warner Brothers now. And yeah, uh, they needed to get rid of this. The, the, the streaming stuff is just is a killer. Like it's dangerous. Look at the debt that Netflix is in over this, and look at the, you can look at the. De- well, I think the Warner Brothers Discovery merger now they're in debt like, God, thirty, fifty, something, thirty. It's a ridiculous amount of billions of dollars that they're in debt. Right, Warner Brothers I think was, like a couple billion in debt. Anyhow, yeah, now it's like five. And Netflix billion. It was is like two fifteen. Uh, well, this Netflix is, the, is like no, but that was the write off, right? Look, I, don't I mean, they were harp- writing all this stuff off so that they couldn't. Uh, uh, as part of it, the, cause they, they just bought them. They're going to have to pay taxes on that. So they're writing a bunch of shit off. So they don't pay as much taxes, but Netflix is like $15 billion in debt and how much money do they have. Like what's their rollover on cash and stuff. I, and they have like no library. I would, if Netflix stopped making movies today and had just their library and was like, does anybody want this? I'd be like, fuck no. There's a couple of movies in there that are at least rewatchable. There's like a I couple said, movies and a couple shows that are really extraction. fantastic. The vast majority of that, uh, Netflix owned actual Netflix stamped, you know, content is dog shit. This is to illustrate your point. There was a movie just recently that they spent two hundred million dollars on, The Gray Man. Does anybody the Man. Re- that came started... and went so fucking quickly? <laughs> Red Notice, the right? same thing that came and Red went Notice, so quickly. The, Nobody go back remembers to Bright. any of that. Oh, how Bright? much money was spent on Bright? Go back. You can go back into uh, all kinds the of Irishman. stuff. Yeah, just think like two hundred wow. million on the Irishman. Wow, it's insane, right? The amount of money they're spending. Yeah, and so Warner Brothers was was steering towards this direction too, right? The bad fucking bad idea, guys. Bad idea. I don't mind that HBO Max can be used as a platform to spin off shows like The Peacemaker, which I thought was really well done. I wasn't a fan of The Watchmen, but I thought that was appropriate for where it was at. It's television, right? The movies that play on there, the movies that would eventually wind up on, oh, hello, HBO TV, right? Right. You know, I mean, the stuff, it makes sense to a degree to have like your, your movies on there and your TV shows, as you say, and stuff, but not your new movies. It was crazy. And even, you know, when, when they became available day of and we were watching them day of, for the most part, I can't think of a memorable one that I saw on their service that was presented to me like that. I think maybe the last Conjuring movie right? I thought was fairly effective. But, I mean, the Suicide Squad was a letdown. Mortal Kombat was a letdown. The Matrix was a letdown. Space Jam. Mm-hmm. On mm-hmm. and on and on. Keep going. Yeah, that, I, I mean, the list kept getting cry mm-hmm. macho. I mean, I could literally go almost over the Saints of the Many Saints of Newark. <laughs> their entire fucking <laughs> slate that I was excited about each week, I'd be like, this is great. It's like having... You know, a pristine copy delivered to your home like you're some sort of famous person. And you watch it and you go, who who commissioned this? Who put money into this? <laughs> who made this? Who marketed this? And then said, fuck yep. it, we're going to dump it. It almost was like they knew that their slate was shit. And they just said, we're going to dump it on here because no one's... Well, the danger... Yeah, the da- that's the danger of the online stuff, right? Is that it's all about title... Uh, uh, just throwing titles on their slap. We have this content. We have this content. We have this content. They don't give a shit about quality, right? This is what Netflix does. Toss it just so much shit up against the wall. And yeah, there's going to be some really good ones out there and they'll really focus on those, but you still have a wall full of shit then. Yeah, it's uh, it's no good. It's You have just things to scroll over and things you've already seen and there's not rewatchability on any of these things. I mean, the amount of Mm -hmm. what I think Netflix is ultimately going to be is just documentaries about true crime because those are very uh, cheap to buy the (laughs) people's life stories. Everyone seems to watch those. I'm serious. I mean, and you don't have to pay big name actors. It's like it's almost like reality television in a sense. You know, they went away from scripted to reality in the networks. Did this is what we're going to see in Netflix because it's just going to be cheaper to go that way. Hell, that's what CW is literally saying they're going to do: start profitable reality television shows instead of the scripted stuff. Lifetime. Um, I mean, literally, that's just a rebirth of Lifetime, a rediscovery of what Lifetime found out long, long ago, right? Yeah, that's fair I mean, enough. Literally. <laughs> so, and, and I'm fine with that. I mean, they should they should make all these different types of movies and content and things, but we are talking about a different level of, I mean, streaming kind of fucked that up where you had movies and you had TV and it, it all kind of crashed together in streaming and it really just brought the quality level down. Where it should have, hopefully, you would have helped that it would have brought the quality level up, and it kind of did, but it it, uh, but yeah, I don't know. After COVID, I guess the, the the collapse of the theater and stuff, it was that was it. Like, I'm gonna just go so far as to even say, the physical 
you know, they call it physical media. We both have an affinity for physical media. Some people will listen to this and go, oh, he's full of shit. He's an old man. But there, the <laughs> act, the physical act of getting somewhere, even if it was to rent something from a red box, from a this, from a that, from a video store, wherever you, you acquired your physical media and you played it, there was an, a, an act of completion. There was a sense of urgency. There was, I, I did something, yeah. and this is to watch it. When it's presented to me, even if it's, in the theater that day, it was hard for me to even push play and get some sort of urgency or a need to watch these or even finish it for that matter. It was a bizarre kind of, uh, I don't know, it was a bizarre experiment that for myself was thinking like, maybe I don't want them presented this easy, these titles, because there is a certain loss of oh, but value not. or respect even, because it didn't go through the proper channels, and I can't just well, no, watch it on it's HBO. It's worse now than it's ever been before as far as a presentation of of the libraries right for streaming stuff because they're algorithmic now and so they hide stuff whereas before it used to just be like the video store here's the categories you go through them and there was new stuff and they still showed you like what was new and everything but now it's like trying to get you to to keep watching things and it's trying to be like smarter than than you and you're like no i know what i fucking want to watch can i go through it And, and if you go through just like the front page of these sites uh or even the apps and stuff you won't even get to a lot of the shit that's good you know you'll never even see it which is uh it's vastly different because i'm watching a lot of physical media now since i have uh, my collection is too big i need to watch it but uh i can't tell you how far more joyous it is to actually go through shelving and like look through all these movies and pick something out and make that selection. And it's so much easier and so much better than scrolling through things, um, uh, online. And you have a sense of time as well. Like I got to pick something and watch it. Whereas online, uh, I don't know. I'm sitting on the couch. There's no sense of time. Like I would be scrolling through shit and that's an hour later. I'm like, fuck, how did it get like, how did it get to be so late? Otherwise, if it's physical, you got to stand, you got to go through it. You go, okay, well I, I gotta go. I gotta get something on. I gotta go watch something, you know? Right, and, and you know, it's just a better t- experience. If you were a kid or a, you know, teenager, you had maybe a parent or a boyfriend or girlfriend nagging at you. It's time to go, so you had to make your, you know, you had to have that safe bet and that wild card bet, maybe. So you read you two just movies, pick some, some stuff, yeah, and watch and, it. And yeah. the, the likelihood that you would stumble across something that you normally wouldn't see, because you know, I want to talk about this. Actually, this is going to lead into um, one of our reviews here of a movie called Ninja Academy that you're going to talk about in a, in a second that you watched that I recommended to you. It's currently playing on Tubi, and I found that movie as a as a seventh grader in a video store because it was a special 99 cent rental, and my parents thought it was a you know goofy karate movie. They didn't realize it was you know full of tits and you know shit like that it was it's awesome but long long story short that movie because i found it the kids on my block watched it they found it we still talk about it in reference points and it had like but then again i think who was the crazy guy driving because i remember used to seeing the guy that sold them the videotapes and it was like some random dude who had a van like a minivan he'd open it up and he'd have tapes in it and the owner of the video store be like looking at tapes and he'd buy this one and that one and that's how i saw death stalker 2 and ninja academy and ski patrol and i just think those fucking mom and pop video <laughs> shops that spent that hundred dollars to buy some random title that they probably didn't need to, you know, or, or wasn't going to sell all that well or rent all that well. And it really, it's just, these are the, I just, first of all, who are the guys driving around selling those tapes back in the day? That's a movie right there. Our show. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. No Jeez. doubt. Well, I'm, that's why all the boutique, uh, 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 you know, Blu-ray and DVD release guys are, are raking it in right now because there, there's a, there's a huge amount of movies from the 80s and 90s uh, to really, and even actually 70s for that matter, to release on the things that you couldn't even imagine, never even heard of and shit for the reason that you're saying now because they made so much crap to to put out on the um on the on the sales floors. Yeah, this had to fill shelves at one point. I mean, that's just, and yeah. it was just, there was an era in that mid 80s time where they, most things were being made. You know, if it didn't have a top star, it was being made for that video shelf. And, it, you know, this is, which is a great era. But I need to ask you, how is that Patrick Swayze bust? Has it haunted <laughs> anybody yet? And no, can you please let fine. people know what is going on with the, what, what this is? I don't, someone had well someone's mom who passed away <laughs> made this this head 
of the of it's a ceramic Swayze. bust of, se- of, of Sir like Patrick, Patrick Swayze. Swayze. That kind of looks like Patrick Swayze. But it looks like if you ask AI like someone's art to put Patrick yeah. Swayze together, and they would come up with that. That's, that is what it looks like. Yeah, it looks like someone's art project, you know, for like high school or something. Um, and they, they were giving away for free, and I thought it was funny and a joke, and I sent my brother, and then he went and got it. <laughs> I thought so now we real, have it in our house and sitting it by the front door and it just wards off evil spirits there I guess yeah does <laughs> anybody know. recognize you had a Halloween party did anybody guess who that was who that bust was no, of? I don't even think anyone looked uh no one person I think they showed it to him um, did, did they think it was Julius but Caesar? nobody knows who it is yeah I, I know right that's basically what it looks like it looks like <laughs> uh, anyone with curly hair and I think there's a it might be a mustache on I don't remember it doesn't it, it's bad so yeah, why why didn't that person just throw it away? Why'd they give it away for free? I don't know. That I think is even weirder. It's pretty fucking horrendous, to be honest with you. Um it's it's no good. It it, it but I love the fact that you picked it up, that you're loving it, and that uh it's it's in your I home. I didn't get it. <laughs> oh yeah, your brother did, but just shit. <laughs> it lives it's amongst not, you, okay? It's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> it lives amongst you. All right, let's get into the review portion of today's show. Uh, we talked briefly, you know, about things that we're going to bring up here, Ninja Academy being one of them. But I want to start off with uh, the big one that's in theaters here, and I want to talk to you about this. It's Black Adam, Dwayne Johnson's bid for superhero stardom. Number one film in the country for the last two weeks. Have you heard good things? What have you been hearing about the movie? Have you heard anything? Yeah, well, I've heard The Rock say it's amazing. Yeah, right? But Disney say everything is, including his shoes, his drinks, his, you know, everything. I mean, this is... His XFL what teams. are you talking about? I, Schwarzenegger says the same thing, and he's right all the time. So I imagine that The Rock is right here. Um, this has been a long time in the making, so I am interested in hearing if it's good. Yeah, everyone says it. It's it, I've not really heard anything bad about it. Let's put it that way. Well, let me be the first one, my friend. Okay. Be- because <laughs> I went to, I snuck away yesterday to go to a two o'clock showing, and I thought this is going to be a fun little time out at the movies. I got to go through my notes here. I, I had notes here. Shit. Um, but what ended up happening was this movie really depressed me. It was an uneasy mixture of you. The Mummy, Green Lantern, T2. Uh-huh. I mean, obvious reference points to T2 where he's the learning, you know, how to do this and he's going to be not as brutal and, you know, I, I, I did not kill uh-huh. anyone type shit, okay? That sh- this movie is so fucking monotonously bad. I don't know what people are talking about. I, I was kind of embarrassed for The Rock, to be honest with you. It's filled with, with, for, with horrible musical cues throughout the entire thing that are not placed very well. It's got nonsensical pop culture references that don't do anything other than distract you from the movie when you're referencing this movie or, you know, I don't need a Sergio Leone homage in in a superhero film with a God versus bad guys. It's got, it's set in the near future or the, the kind of early future setting. And it's got these, inner gang guys that drive around and police every an occupying force that have some sort of futuristic powers but those aren't really the bad it's a confused film for how simple it is first of all the only buddy the only person that comes off well in it is Pierce Brosnan who's great as Dr. Fate I think everybody else overplays underplays their character including Adam Smasher Hawkman and Johnson himself as as Black Adam I really couldn't believe for something that cost $195 million and that has special effects in every shot how cheap this movie looked. It basically takes place in two or three settings. It's, it's, hmm. I mean, to say that the plot's <laughs> almost a non sequitur, it's just all over the fucking place. And to think that Green Lantern took the beating it took, this is every bit as bad or without the guilty pleasure factor for me at least as Green Lantern. And the thing that kept sticking in my mind as I watched this was when Stallone said back in the day that Michael Keaton getting into the Batman uniform was the last days of the muscle man because you didn't need the real muscles anymore. And Tim Burton even said, why would a guy that's so jacked put on a suit to do this and that? It doesn't make sense. 
I thought The Rock looked silly in this movie, to be honest with you. I didn't find him yeah, a know, charismatic I'm not, I'm figure. I'm not like the... Um, it's, it's foolish to me. This looks really? almost parodied. Do so you think it took away his, his charisma? I, I think so. I think there's a couple line I, mean, I agree with you. I don't like the outfits. The outfit, it's 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 fucking it's I I don't know I I'm I felt almost embarrassed for him in this film. The camera does this thing that started in Aquaman and has now turned into its own type of filmmaking in these movies where you don't really have any film language anymore. In that I mean a master shot, a close up coverage, right? You just have a camera yeah. that has no physical yeah. limitations that can shoot forward at 500 miles an hour. Pull back, shoot me 360 around so I have no point of reference or or any sort of geometry to what I'm looking at. It's it's gotten to the point of just preposterousness where I don't even know where the filmmaking skill is here. I thought some some sequences were Zack Snyder esque, which is kind of a compliment in that it looked like that. But then I thought, isn't this weren't they moving away from this the Snyder aesthetic? And the whole to me, I think the reason that everybody's going out of the theater and giving it a great audience score is one, they're drinking the rocks Kool-Aid and two, it's got a, <laughs> a an interesting post credit sequence and that is going to lead up to something down the road, which in my opinion should have been this fucking movie. So now I'm two hours into something that I'm just, it, it and if for a two hour movie, a fairly short experience for a superhero movie, it lagged. I did not find the humor mm-hmm. to work. I did not find the special effects all that special, even though they were they were there in abundance. I thought, like I said, that the performances were over and underplayed, and Pierce Brosnan's the only one that walks away from this with any sort of, uh, once again, a movie star. And not just an influencer, not just a social media star, but a fucking movie star. I was talking to you off air about seeing Tickets to Paradise, and that movie is what it is, but there's a joy in watching movie stars do what they do. It's a joy in watching Tom Cruise in the new Top Gun. It's a joy to watch Pierce Brosnan still command the screen as Dr. Fate. This movie, though, is lost. I don't understand it, and I think it's very, very forgettable. I, I highly, highly don't recommend this movie. Thumbs down over here, <laughs> or negative review on me. So not not to shit on it. And I went in with every, I don't want to think that I went in there jaded. I like The Rock. I've liked most of The Rock's movies, mm-hmm. if not 99% of them. But this is to me, for, for spending 15 years to bring this to the screen, maybe they should have spent another year on the script before they did. Because this is, if this was the script that's been floating around that whole time, it's, it's embarrassing that they, this is what it is. It really is. It makes Judge Dredd look like a masterpiece of writing i'm serious yeah well i don't know i, mean, I think Zack snyder has been hanging on around the dc stuff for too long i don't think he's, he's done it them any favors um i would also point surprisingly i think jj abrams is kind of shit at running things like that as well and my only hope is that james gunn who if you've seen any of the uh, guardians of the galaxy movies has managed to in the marvel universe um have his own touch in those movies, as well as especially the first one. You can see whole scenes play out uh, just brilliantly directed. And um, so I, my only hope is that we get some of that, you know, injected into these DC movies. I don't know if, I don't know. I don't just know where they go from here. There's nothing more. I mean, how many times can the galactic fight between the hero, or in this case, the anti-hero Black Adam, and the, the mega villain to come down to a fist fight or some sort of karate match. I mean, it's fucking, how many times can you see that? We're ultimately, and now I'm just watching a WWF match in a mm-hmm. crazy CG setting because they're just throwing each other through walls and punching, you know, it's like the, the fight to end I mean, all that fights. That would be the corporate, you know, that's the, the equivalent of uh, when we make a music video, we must see the band playing, right? Because that's what people want to see. Uh, you know, back in the day, that was a big, one of the big deals, right? Then that, that came, was more, it was a corporate viewpoint, right? You had to have those, you had to show the band playing. Cause it was like people who would then want to go see concerts. Cause they would, you know, you could, the, there's the band playing. You want to go see them. They would correlate it to concert going. And I think that's the same thing that would be happening here, right? You have to have the fight. People want to see the big special effects and the big fight and stuff. And, uh, it, yeah, I don't think that's true. I think people want to see a good story. Yes, and, and I mean, this that's always been true. So does yeah. not have a good story. There is some odd CG. I don't want to say de aging, but de de bodying. <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a version of Dwayne Johnson here where he's not right. Well, super they just jacked. Borrowed, and it's like Chris Evans. I think they, 
In, in, it's it's weird to see Dwayne Johnson's say, body or face on a body that's not <laughs> mesomorphed. <laughs> they just borrowed the Scorpion King model and <laughs> put him in there. You know? uh, but moving on, Black Adam. It's the number one film in the country, and I don't know how. Please, people, make better choices, including myself. <laughs> okay, let's talk about another movie that's out in theaters right now, also available on streaming. Halloween Kills, the final chapter in David Gordon Green's... No, uh, ends. Halloween Ends, I'm sorry. Halloween Kills was the second one. Is still in theaters? Yes, it was, because I, I was going to sneak out of Black Lord. Adam yesterday to go see something, and there's nothing in theaters <laughs> that I want to see. So I sat through the entire two hours, because uh, although Terrifier was going to start, I thought, I'm just not ready for a two and a half hour ultra just gory movie in the middle of the day yeah. i think <laughs> i've got to enjoy my day no. Yeah. No. so uh, halloween, well, halloween ends. ends um let me tell you real briefly because i know we have differing opinions let's bring everyone up to date the original halloween or 19 2018's halloween i was not keen on when i saw it in the theater i felt it was very underwhelming i've reassessed it a couple times now i've watched it twice on uh, home mm. media and it's grown on me both times in terms of the technique and the story that it's setting up. So I think I unfairly judged it the first time. It's grown on me. I still think Hollywood Halloween Kills last year's is an excellent example of what this genre and what this series can be using topical issues and infusing it in the horror genre. I really, especially with Anthony Michael Hall's performance. I thought Halloween Kills was better than Halloween. Are you flip flop on that? How do you feel on the first two? Yeah, I'm flip flop on that yeah oh, so I, mean, I would say the same the same thing but backwards of that I think they're both very good movies but I thought the first one was more interesting as far as um, uh, looking at the characters and, and through their eyes trying to define Michael Myers I thought that was a real interesting take on it and the movie does uh, delivers all the kills it delivers all, all the all the, the horror stuff and the second one uh, was interesting in that it took it like re- they didn't reverse that, but it took that and made it like from the town people's point of view, from like the common person's point of view, like what the hell was going on. Um, and so that was really interesting. And it was way more uh, actiony in that sense. There was more, um, it's more brutal. To be honest uh, with you. I, I was just going to say, yeah, there's just more, it, it was just more actiony or whatever. And so it kind of felt like uh, to me anyways, it felt like it was building, right? Like the first one, was setting the stage, setting the scene, telling you who all these main characters were. The second one was was a second movie. It was filler, yes, but it was interesting. It was showing you like uh, from a different angle, kind of what things are going on and and what and building towards an, an an eventual end, right? And then we get Halloween ends, and I don't know what the f- I don't know where this came from because this is not the building to. It's not like it's a bad movie. It just doesn't fit, right? Am I wrong? I don't know what this is. I, I don't know because... It's interesting, but it's... Uh. It's not an outright failure by any means that people you know, say they want to cut their eyes out and petition to, to remake the film. I think but it's not a conclusion to the story that, that they were telling is my problem. <laughs> no, because that technically, if you watch this, then I believe that that technically already concluded with the second movie. Right, that's what I felt too. That there's I was no like, need this for is this. Nothing. One. Yeah, this is absolutely nothing. We already did this. It's not even that interesting. And some of the stuff, I mean, like, like uh, having uh, Lori, like, what be murder she wrote is just ridiculous. I, why uh, some of the things they chose to do with these characters in this movie is like uh, boring. It's all hell and pointless. I don't even understand it. I do want to give the movie a bit of credit in a couple areas. One, the first 10 minutes I thought was fantastic. The opening sequence sure. that sets the movie up was, I thought, I mean, sure. unexpected and fantastic. And I thought that it was going to have maybe nothing to do with the overall story. But then when you come to find out that that's where the story is headed and this character of Corey is going to be the, the mantle of horror and that this mm-hmm. is basically a contractual obligation for a sequel put on film. It's as depressing as as the movie went on. It, look, it tries some artsy things. It takes some big swings and some big misses, and it connects on a few things. But as it went on, I, I thought to myself, this is almost like watching one of those dreary Halloween sequels we got in the 90s or the Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, the, the endless Friday the 13th ones that weren't very good, where it's just a... It's a cash grab. It's a it's a it's a spot filler because you had a weekend and you had set something up 
And to me, it's a total cop out artistically. Why? Tell me why again. Lori is so intent on introducing this boy to her granddaughter, well, and I, why that know. romance takes off so fucking quickly when this guy well, is disinterested it, in the least. How does she all, all of a sudden know because of a look he gave her? I mean, it's yeah. the the things that Lori is in, is is tasked to do and the changes She's in her character. She wrote it all, are writing it all down. <laughs> not connected at all to the person that she was in the first. 2018 version of Halloween, let yes. alone the mm-hmm. earlier yeah. versions. So I don't I know. know why or why did this have to be? This should have been a Halloween presents. Michael Myers living in a sewer <laughs> who is feeding yeah. off the souls of homeless people. I mean, what is going on and here? And then you're not even sure that he's real for some of it. And then, then he is real. And then it's just like, this is nonsense, guys. And I actually, I disagree with your take on that this is some like failed art or not like they weren't being artistic about this is some cash grab i think this is high art and that's the problem i thought their i thought their attempts at high art were somewhat laughable when he was talking to Lori and she wasn't there possibly but there are moments there are moments when he's on that motorcycle and she's on the back and you're like oh my god this is such a fucking high art like it it was good right with the music it was out of place but But it was a moment in this movie, the, uh, probably one of the big moments, and he's just like, this has nothing to do with anything. This guy's a murderer, and he's getting this girl, and he's like hiding it. And you're like, what? What does that have to do with anything? I don't even know. I don't even know what it means. You it know, was but a it Mickey is and Mallory art. type story. Honestly, that's what I yeah, thought they were going for. It's you know? high art to a degree that just doesn't even. It doesn't really fit in any of this. It doesn't make any sense. I would have preferred to have seen, uh, you know, a Lori and Michael. Um, face off like to the end through the whole movie well they are well, not what we got trevor they blew their wad they at the beginning that. of the first You're one right. that was the big the big climactic ultra bad they showdown did it in the second one too and it, so it kept building so i thought this one would just be a bigger version of those two right not whatever the hell this is i i, I couldn't believe how how poorly they were treating their characters that they built up killing off the daughter at the second one i should have known was a questionable move but I thought okay right? they need to do that to put Lori and the granddaughter together to put them because Michael's coming after both of them and she's the last generation and Lori's granddaughter would technically be the last bloodline but then to get this and the kid with the creepy scarecrow mask or whatever the fuck he's got going on and the mm-hmm. I mean the actor himself the acting's good I can't say the performances aren't good and that there isn't the acting's fantastic I mean I the, just the think direction's the, really good the movie's just not what it should be it's it's a it's a failed movie that's going to be talked about for a long for a long time in the series you know fans of the series, but when you put it up against other, well, what I, you know, the, mm-hmm. the cash grab entries, if you will, I still prefer those. Sure, I, yeah, honestly. me too, me as well. I think those are funner, but I think that's the point of this, right? Is that even the cash grab ones? And this is what I mean by high art. The cash grab ones were trying to deliver a product that they knew that someone wanted, right? I don't know who asked for this version of Halloween. Who wants this? Well, apparently not a lot of people, unless you're just a pig su- consumer, you know, who's just shoveling everything into your mouth. It's like, oh, it's great. It says Halloween and it has Michael Myers, which there's plenty of those people out there um, and good on them. Including Stephen never King. Have, you know, they'll never see a bad movie, you know, so, so yeah, good for them. But uh, for everybody else, yeah, this was just, it's not for the fans. It's not for even for just really casual people. I don't know who this is for other than... Um, you know, it's pretentious, really, to make a Halloween movie like this. In my mind, that's the best. You know, and I've heard for it. It's interesting because I, I know that people have said, like, well, in the first Halloween, the original, right? Michael Myers is barely in the movie, so you know, you His know, presence compare that is to in this every Halloween. Frame. Compare that to this Halloween ends. Compare it to that. Like he's barely in the movie, and you think, well, that's true. Except that Halloween doesn't have two other movies in front of it. Right. Le- building up and leading up to this. Not only that, Michael Myers presence <laughs> so n- is felt work. in every frame. He lords of over course. that movie, even when he's not there. That's the difference in this. I was waiting at, at 55 minutes in. I thought this can't really be happening. You know, I'm glad I didn't see this in the theater <laughs> because I, I would have been highly fucking it is irritated. Unbelievable. I mean, when he falls, when they push him over the, by the way, why, why do those kids keep fucking with him? They, there's a, there's a point they push him over the bridge, right? And he falls down and they run away scared. 
aren't they done at that point? Why do they come back? Because they're plot the fucking, contrivances. They're fucking. No they're shit. Not, well, at that point, they are right. They're it makes not even no characters. Since whatsoever, I just don't even get it at that point. Like, it, it, that, well, at that point, the movie's so far gone, it just doesn't matter. But and why yeah, the, the minute fuck? he the minute he fell down there, and and I, and I just knew that he was Michael Myers was going to be down there. I was like, God, this is bad. I th- I the the most. I mean, I was so bored at that part. I was thinking, oh, this is interesting. The guy, the old guy who runs the auto body yard where these kids are fucking uh-huh. with them is in his office watching Hard Target. Why the fuck was he watching <laughs> Hard Target with the Van Damme movie? I was like, what a weird <laughs> We'd homage all is that? we be watching Hard Target. But um, I, I hope David Gordon Green gets back on the, on the track of making either uh, esoteric dramas or stoner comedies because this, this horror uh, experiment has ended very badly. Um, I think he, in my opinion, he's he's two for three on these. Really, one is a, is a gem. The other one is is okay. I could you know take it or leave it. But this last one, out of all the horror movies that are out right now, with Smile and Barbarian and these things that are getting great reviews, Black Phone, mm-hmm. which was great, I, I watch this one. That's what I get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk about a horror comedy that premiered on Netflix recently. It's Rob Zombie, who was known for Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses, does the family-friendly comedy routine in The Munsters, an ultra HD, um, very amusing little throwback comedy, something that I didn't have high expectations for. In fact, as I was watching it, I texted you and asked you, please watch it, because I didn't know if I was losing my fucking mind as a critic because I was enjoying it and snarking here and there and uh, just was, was overall very pleased <laughs> with the film. I mean, it's not a great piece of entertainment, but it's in the vein of uh, what I thought was the Barry Sonnenfeld uh, Adams Family films back in the 1990s. It had that kind of vibe. I always liked the Munsters. And um, I don't know, I like the look of this film. They spent a lot of time on the production design, on the cinematography, on uh, the, the makeup. And I thought the casting was good enough and the, the storyline was good enough. I thought this could have been released in the 90s, in, in that period when they were redoing the Brady Bunch movies and things like that. It kind of had that mm, vibe Adam's to me. Adams Family and stuff. Yeah, exactly. What was your? Uh, I, so I positively recommended it to you. Was I crazy, yeah, so, or did you you like this too? Uh, so the trailer for this obviously is god awful. Well, let me just first yeah, put that out there. That there's no confidence in this trailer of this, and so I thought, well, I'll throw this on. I'm I'm, I'm in bed. I'm going to bed. I'll throw this on. I'll watch it for ten minutes. I'll fall asleep. And goddamn, if I didn't watch the whole fucking movie, was it not fantastic? <laughs> yes, this is a monsters movie, and it's monsters in the sense of this could be an actual monsters movie. It plays out much like uh, anything from well, all, all the other monster movies, right? Um, or even an episode of the TV show. Um, and I was more upset that it ended so abruptly after almost two hours, because um, I wanted more of an ending to it, I guess, or I I didn't want it to end. It, it, it's a it's a feel good movie, surprisingly, and it's just a, such a, it was so easy to watch. There was just nothing in it that um, I, I don't know. There was a showstopper, I guess. There was nothing, uh, no bumps or anything in it. It was just a, an easy, nice, easy watch. Exactly what you expect from the monsters, from these characters. I think Rob Zombie actually did a, a really good job on this one. <laughs> I thought so too with directing the tone of it because this wasn't an easy yes. tone that he set off initially. It's this. It's almost like you stumbled upon a, a creature feature type movie, like a horror movie from the 1950s, late night, min, you know, midnight show with. Uncle Fe- not Uncle Fester. What's the the Dracula character? The other uh, the uncle raising at night from the coffin and his daughter taking on these suitors and she's taking you know she's going out with Nosferatu mm-hmm. and she's doing this and he's showing her. Yeah, I thought the dating scenes were amusing. The musical number was amusing. I mean, is it laugh out loud funny in a couple spots actually? But is it overall just a pleasant experience and really a surprise compared on what I thought I was getting with that trailer? Totally. So I'm glad I, I thought I was going crazy when I was watching this. I thought, um, cause you know, my girlfriend was watching it and she was not enjoying not a single scene of it. She didn't so, like it. No, not, not a single scene. <laughs> so, and I'm over there <laughs> like, Oh shit. That is it just me. Well, I think it's kind of good. <laughs> so. Yeah. I don't know. Then I, I watched it and really enjoyed it too. I, this is one that I've seen people be fairly split on. Um, which I can understand because it really is nothing. It's not. There's no. no it's a lark in this movie whatsoever. But that's what the monsters kind of is. If you ever watch the monsters, it's they just kind of fucking fuck around for a while. It's they don't really. 
do anything, you know, in particular or special. Yeah, I don't need to learn something about the world or myself with the Munsters movie. This is exactly the kind of yeah. feature I got. And this is Universal so. 1440 releasing, which does all their direct-to-DVD or uh, lowbrow yeah. knockoffs like Eraser Reborn. Mm. Have you watched Eraser Reborn? No. I need to give you my HBO Max log on. There's a couple of movies. I'm going to give you my HBO Max log on, and there's two movies I need you to watch, Barbarian and it's Eraser Reborn. Yeah. Uh, both of varying yeah. quality. Trust me. One is very good. One is not. I'll I guess you Eraser Reborn is amazing, and Barbarian that, sucks. That's the one that I got the HBO <laughs> Max subscription for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on and talk about another horror film. We're just full of horrors tonight, and that's going to be oh, Hellraiser. It was October. Yeah, it was October, and that's a, a good regimen for horror films, but... Hellraiser, Hulu's reimag- Hulu picked up this reimagining that was uh, released based on Clive Barker's very, very famous creation. Hellraiser has been made, it gave him a, a little bit of a, a makeover here. It's a female that's running it this time. Um, pleasantly surprised with this one, to be honest with you. I wasn't expecting much, and coming off of the original series, didn't know where this was going to be headed, and I thought that this was effective, more effective than uh, you know going into it was going to be. But what I mm-hmm. did like about this movie is that it didn't, it played it serious. It didn't take itself for laughs there because the original series is not a, it's not humorous. You know, it's not a Freddy Krueger. There's not a lot of jokes being no. cracked. Um, I liked the relationship <laughs> between the brothers and sister. I was very odd. To, it took a while to develop, and I was a little disjointed in the first act, but then. When mm-hmm. you know the end of the first act, things started to come together a little bit more, and um, the the mm. I thought the puzzle box was handled in an interesting way in terms of an addiction. So um, I'm giving this, you know, I'm on the I'm on the fence with it, but I am giving it a positive recommendation. It's not a glowing review for me. It's but it's it's better than some of those direct to DVD sequels that we had gotten in recent year. Um. Uh, well, sure, but I mean, I, I wouldn't compare this to those. I would say that the the veins of the original story are in here. I don't really think this is masterfully put together or told, and misses a, kind of a lot from what the first one uh, had. I thought the characters were god awful. I hated them. You didn't uh, like the I brother hated every sister. single one of them. No, fuck them. No, God, especially her. She's horrendous as a character. Not the acting's fine, you know, and the the filmmaking um, was okay too. It, it looks pretty standard horror to me. I don't think uh, it required any. Where it didn't look like it had anyone special at the helm, you know, I should say that. Um, and but the effects are fine. The um, makeup's good. I mean, I have no problem um, with the, the, the new makeup's Hellraiser good. Girl, Special the effects pinhead. are good. The the box is fine. Yeah, I mean, I'll say one thing. It just doesn't matter, you know. I one thing that kind of you know the wokeness stuff ruins movies for me still at this point because there's so much arguing about. Oh, it's a girl now, and um, I saw more arguments. F- for her for it being a girl that I did anyone complaining that it was a girl and it was nonsense stuff like well in the original book it's she said to be like asexual and she has a feminine vo- and it, like pinhead has a feminine voice and then I saw the movie and it's like well why'd they deepen the voice then your whole argument's nonsense. There's all these arguments out here about shit. Well, why are we going to the original text like it's the Bible or something? I mean, who gives a shit? It's what works best for the movie. And Doug Bradley in the first four. I guess to some degree. I mean, fantastic. this is based on that, clearly. Right? It has all the uh, same undertones and a lot of the same stuff as the first one, but it doesn't have the, the hit that the first one does, right? It doesn't have the, the importance of those things in it because. Um, it doesn't have the well, sexual think, energy. Lesser Let's be honest. Le- with. Le- with Uncle Frank and the mom, not you know, the stepmom that, yes, and all but that. that whole thing, the way that that plays out is kind of important to, uh, uh, to the story being told. And that stuff is in here, but it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't make any sense because it's not the same. It's not the same exact setup, but that stuff is, is kind of still here. So yeah, I, I really felt that this is, it's fine. I feel like Hellraiser movies. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with the movie, but this just is not that great of a movie. I don't really could care less. It's. Uh, I rewatched recently Hellraiser two. I put that on just to, uh-huh. just to, yeah, it was Halloween type time, and I was kind of putting that on just to see what was going on because that used to be a very tough watch for me as a kid in terms of how gross and intense it was. I, know. I, just, still I need to get that one. Uh, that one's that Hellbound is, is. Is there was an uncut version that they released on video back yes, in the day. Yes, that's and, the one I'm gonna get. Oh yeah, it was him and the girl were on it. You know the two. Wait, so uh, the last one I had to get. Well, no, I, I had. I don't have the last. The, the other two. 
either. That one, um, I mean, that one specifically was it was uh-huh. very hard to get through as a kid because it, you know you'd rent it, and you'd be like, oh shit, you know, it's like this is legit horror. And yeah, I know that's dread, why I and, watch and, and that. you know, it's but you, know, you watch it now. And I know times have changed, this and that, but I don't think young kids are putting this on at a sleepover and getting that sense of like oh fuck like we're doing something forbidden here or like we're about to watch something that's just you know balls out crazy oh no and this that's is, why they're going way, to terrifier too and things like that which are that's what i was just gonna say this is not that kind of this is a normal this is it's a normal basic movie it's a yeah. hulu movie it's it really just plays like any other horror movie like the atmosphere is very much like anything else it is what you would expect a movie like this to look like that's what it looks like right so to some degree uh, I guess, you know, that's the corporatism, the consumerism uh, kind of toning down something that, that should be more artistic, should be more interesting, especially with a movie like this and a Clive Barker movie. Come on. The Hellraiser, um, the, so, the yeah. very concept mm. uh, lends itself to being as artistic as possible. If David Gordon Green wanted to tell that same story of Corey and the girl being a rampage, why couldn't it have been possessed through the box? Take that story and put it in a fucking Hellraiser. Uh, give it all the artistic you know, gonna, embellishment you want. Thing, you know? If you had taken that high art of Halloween ends and had kind of applied more of that to this Hellraiser movie, it would have been way better. I agree. So I, I don't. So figure that shit out for yourself. Yeah, you that's know? a I, strange I, mathematical equation. I don't know equation. how that's gonna how that's how all this stuff pans out, but the, I, I just you know, and even for the Hellraiser movies that are bad, um, those I still like, um, but more so because they're bad. You know, I, I don't mind a bad movie, but um, there's certainly a uh, uh, something to a bad movie that would make it watchable, you know, which is not something that I normally see nowadays when I see bad movies. They're not actually, they're just not watchable. It's true. I mean, bad, there's a lot of things I've turned off recently because it's just not worth my time finishing because one, I didn't right? physically rent them. So it's easy just to turn it off. You well, know, <laughs> I used to stay with the bad movies back in the day. You know, my, my, my dad used to see something that cracked me up. He would fast forward through shitty scenes in a movie that he didn't like just to get to the end. Like if we were uh-huh. watching a movie, and he, we remember watching sure. Dear God with them. Couldn't stand the fucking movie, and he goes, "I'm gonna finish it." Just kept fast forwarding through certain <laughs> scenes. <laughs> I've done, we've done, I've done that too. Yeah, I don't blame him. I think everything looks so similar now. Everything goes through the same meat grinder. That um, yeah, I just kind of tune out. You do tend to want to turn things off, you know, because you're not seeing anything new, really. No, it's just not compelling. That's what it is. Yeah. Let's talk about a couple of older movies. One is Ninja Academy. I recommended that to you. I told the story at the top of the show about finding this in a video store as a kid in seventh grade when I had Poison Oak and I was home from school, was allowed to rent this. Uh, it's basically a police academy ripoff where a bunch of misfits sign up for a ninja academy in Los Angeles and they are the misfits, go to war or go to do battle with the high-end Beverly Hills Ninja Academy down the way. Uh, this is from Nico Mastriani who is, uh, I want to say, a Greek filmmaker who's made a lot of interesting low-budget films. He has his own collection of DVDs. I own this on DVD now. I cherish this thing. I made my girlfriend watch it a couple years back. She wasn't <laughs> the biggest fan, but she actually got a couple of chuckles out of it along the way. Well, she didn't leave you. so She didn't leave me, and she actually did a podcast <laughs> on it about it with me, so that's nice of her. But what was your reaction to this? Because I was, I, whenever I recommend something that's near and dear to my heart like this, I'm always worried that you're going to look at this and go, what the fuck is this? Because I, honestly, I loved this when <laughs> I was 12, and I still love it today. But. Well, I like the Police Academy movies. I like any movie with snowboarding or skiing, <clears throat> if you know what I'm talking about. Hell yeah. Uh, so uh, Ninja Academy, yeah, this is right up my alley. I, liked, right it. I liked it a lot. It's uh, completely ridiculous. It reminds me a lot of Police Academy. Um, which I guess is the point. Yeah, I mean, the main character is but, a Gutenberg um, ripoff, let's be honest, right? He's Mahoney in oh, a lot the, of ways. Oh, the opening of the movie, when they all show up to the Academy and stuff, is like, oh, this is this is Police Academy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it was fun like that. It's just a bunch of nonsense, uh, ridiculous... Uh, Hijinks. Uh, people, yeah, acting ridiculously, right? C- complete characters and just... Uh, um, Clearly, a world um, supported by you know nothing, even like monetarily wise. Like, where do these people get their money from? I, there are movies that exist like this. Don't you wonder? Like, how do you keep this academy going? Who's paying for it? Are these people actually paying to go here? You never see any money exchange. Well, how it's much just, does a mime make to go to this academy? Because the one guy has to go that, to his father you know, to get a loan to go there, but these other people can just afford it. 
I know, but and then at the end, the the main character just stays there. Like you're just gonna move in. I don't. What does that mean? Like I'm <laughs> so confused about this whole right? thing. <laughs> yeah, like I'm so confused about it. But that's how these movies are. You know, they don't give a shit. They, it's like everyone lived happily ever after. They're here right now. Ridiculous shit's gonna happen. So well, sit you know down you're in up. for it. In the first scene, when it starts off, uh, there's a, a a karate fight or a kung fu fight in a in a little Japanese. Yeah. Uh, village over the possession of the sword, the two best students. And you think it might be a real, you know, if you need the Ninja Academy, you kind of know it's a comedy. But if you, you're watching that scene, you go, oh, this might be like a martial arts film until the, the main guy cheats and then says, ah, fuck it. I've had enough of this grasshopper shit and just leaves the academy. <laughs> and yeah. it's just, a, that sets just the tone for the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, but no, this is grasshopper <laughs> shit. So, I mean, out of, out of the main characters that were presented there, you had, you know, the Gutenberg character, you got the James Bond guy, you got the Rambo caricature, you got the mime, yeah. um, our mime, you got the, the two females there. Was there anybody that you gravitated towards in terms of, of comedic value to you? You got the nerd as well. No, I thought they all worked as a, as a whole. Really, um, I think the main character had well, it, I guess mostly about who got what what lines. You know, I thought the girls were funny sometimes. I thought the main character is funny. The Rambo guy was had some. I loved the some Rambo stuff guy too. So it just depended on what scene it was and who got what lines. You know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, when the, I mean the, the the fantasy sequence, you know, with the full yeah. magazine and a chick with big tits, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> just, uh, some of that shit just cracked me up. And uh, and the guy who plays, I think it's Will Egan who plays the main character in this, has actually got a nice little screen mm-hmm. presence to him. Uh, I thought, you know, he's got like the Gutenberg character yeah. of the, the, the show. I thought he had a decent little screen presence. And he right, he's got the hair. You know? Yeah, he's definitely got the hair. He's the pretty boy of the of the film, if yeah. you will. Um, and he, The face of the group. <laughs> yeah, the face. That's exactly what he is. Um, he reteamed with this director on another film after, and I, it's on Tubi as well, and I've never seen it, but I've always told myself I should give that a shot based on the director and the, the lead actor mm. that I like from this. So. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, to, I'll send you I'll the link on that, that one down. too. Yeah, I've seen that. yeah, this is on uh, Amazon Prime for anyone that doesn't want to watch it on Tubi with ads as well. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so it's it is available now, but this was very hard to come by. I mean, like I said, I rented this and oh, I, bro, I mean, this is the DVD transfer. It. Actually, this I believe as I was watching, I was like, this is like standard definition. Like this is like this is the DVD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I bought my DVD they didn't do back a new in transfer for this <laughs> 2003 even. So I've had it for quite a while. Yeah, and it's but, widescreen, I imagine. Uh, probably yeah I, I think it is and it, yeah. it has like interactive menus you know what I mean it's got no yeah. special features on it or anything well, I just wonder if because it, it was a full screen one that'd be an even older transfer but, it might be if, I'll have to hunt um, that fucker down and, and take a look now that I say that I bet it's widescreen because this really looks like a D, like a DVD transfer from uh, 20 years ago or so I mean the the VHS box itself was such a shitty because uh, the the DVD cover is a Photoshop of the of the t- the older man and then the the female so they kind of make it, they don't even really tell you what it is but the the, the VHS box was uh, more comedic looking if you will it looked like more of a comedy and a fun type movie whereas this they were trying to sell I feel like as a martial arts film which clearly is not although there is some fighting in it <laughs> is there. I mean, why is this? There's a lot of, there's a lot of buffoonery. I mean, buffoonery. And not only that, there's a part where they just stumble upon a nudist colony where everybody's beautiful playing volleyball. I understand that. (laughs) Understand it. I mean, but that's the kind of, well, that's the time period. It's, it was actually quite perfect. Yes. It it was, it not only is it perfect, it was on the dot time wise of when they needed some nudity in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, let's move on and talk about another film that I had recommended to you, and again with bated breath, Magic Crystal. This is a 1985 Asian production with Andy Yu, uh, Cynthia Rothrock, and the incomparable Richard Norton as the villain. This is E.T. meets Raiders of the Lost Ark meets a really low-budget Jackie Chan <laughs> war off. I mean, this thing, the paper mache alien at the end, the only thing that yeah. could look maybe uh, could replace it is that Patrick Swayze bust you have in your front room there. Maybe they could have used that as the alien Possibly. head at the end because the paper mache fifth grade level that they got is so laughably bad. And this movie is so batshit crazy in terms of plotting coherency. Um, I mean, there's, it's almost nonlinear in its, its approach to this, the, to things. What, what did you feel about this? Were you not thoroughly entertained? Yeah. Uh, this is an off the wall, Hong Kong, um, oddity family movie I, I don't know how i would describe this but it was uh yeah it was a 
more of a fun, you know, trip. But it was obviously lots of action in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's like a spy thriller movie that turns into an Indiana Jones movie. It's weird. It's very weird. Th- th- this sci-fi uh, um, stuff. I don't know. <laughs> it, yeah, that, none, of, none of that works. It's odd. But, I mean, the none whole thing's odd. The, the green glowing yeah. fucking jade rock that the little boy holds around the is thing, odd. Yeah, that's like alive or whatever. The the uncle who is bizarre and who keeps doing creepy things around women and doesn't work and uh, yeah, it's you, a weird movie. It, it's a it's a travel log <laughs> as well. I mean, they go to they go to Greece at one point to the ruins where the guy spray paints. That's what I'm the, saying. It's like Indiana Jones in a way. Like it's like this weird like because like, it starts off as like a uh, um like a spy movie with Literally, a training like montage. He's gonna, he's gonna and go steal that. Yeah, there's like KGB agents and shit in it. Um. Yeah, like really starts off as like a, I guess like a Hong Kong spy movie. Like it's obviously like a Jackie Chan police story he, type deal. I was gonna say, okay, uh, he's like a, a martial arts type, type a James Bond guy basically in some way, and then he gets kind of roped into this Indiana Jones thing, <laughs> and they go around doing nonsense like it's a mummy movie. Ah, it's fucking weird, you know. <laughs> there are some spectacular fight scenes in it, being in, uh, in Hong Kong production. You know, during the time when safety protocols were not really in place yeah. these people did just absolutely insane fucking things and their physical attributes are just fairly amazing to to behold but uh story wise this is it's hard to to keep a beat on where the story is going or you know care about any of the characters so it, it is a wonder and it's 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 an, an oddity is the best way to describe it but it's a perfect midnight movie it's available on youtube out there in some forms if you can find it on any other format i'm, I'm sure it's gonna be the same transfer and none of these have ever been clean transfers um they're, they're mm-hmm. grainy and and dubbed terribly and the musical score is, is 1970s porn level but there are a couple of moments in it that are fucking hilarious and i it's unintentional humor maybe sure but that just adds to the overall quality of it yeah, I mean, this is so bad, it's good, um, in my opinion. But it is bad, so I don't... <laughs> yeah, it's not like Ninja Academy, which is actually enjoyable. Uh, you kind of have to, yeah, get through this one. You, you got to be in the right frame of mind or not be in your right frame of mind to get into this one. <laughs> All right, let's move on to talk about trailers. Wrapping up the evening, we got a few trailers to discuss with you guys tonight. Top of the list is going to be Creed 3 the film that was pushed back from its Thanksgiving 22, 22 Jesus Christ I can't speak 2022 release date to mm. March 3rd 2023 trailer dropped I'm very surprised I didn't think that I was going to be all that interested in a Creed film coming off you're the second talking one. bad about this like Michael B. Jordan directing I yeah well hey they I heard some negative things it was pushed back <laughs> yeah. this that and the other I uh-huh. will say this I am intrigued by not only the story, I think Jonathan Majors, who's the villain, obviously, in this piece, is a fucking beast. I think he looks great in this role. I think that the actual filmmaking looks like it's doing okay. It's going to still play service of some sort to the Rocky franchise. I think they're going to take bits of Rocky V, Rocky III, mix it in with what they've already got going, which is the Rocky II scenario with the baby and the losing your hunger. But I do want to see this. I am I'm up for it, and uh, I'm surprised how into it I was. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I liked Creed the first one. The second one I, I was okay with. I was kind of written off Creed. I was kind of done with it. And I think the best thing uh, that this franchise has done so far is to get rid of Rocky because this is uh, Creed's finally Creed. You know, this feels like. Its own deal. It feels like it feels like a movie in the Rocky universe. This feels true to Rocky and spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and finally, yeah, this looks really interesting. I really want to see this. I think this could be, uh, uh, you know, great action, great boxing, great drama. Yeah, I think so too. I'm I'm really surprised. I you know, if I'm being honest, I do think that Creed two, it's it's not anywhere near what Creed was, and I do think that it's a failed, ultimately a failed experiment at it feels pro- like a gimmick prolonging yeah. the Rocky myth, and I feel like that Creed itself yeah. wasn't strong enough as a character to withstand his whole movie. He needed still the Rocky element and to tie up some loose ends, and in doing that, turned the Creed character it's into true. this kind of petulant, whiny child that became somewhat off-putting yeah. to me as a character by the end of the but second one. It feels one. strong in this one. It feels like this feels like um, like I. 
whatever creed this is here feels like I understood. I knew the movies that came before this, uh, even though, you know, imaginary movies that, that brought him up. Like this, this feels like a Rocky three, a Rocky four, yeah. like creed, you know what yes, I mean? Like it I feels agree. deep in the franchise. Like he's strong now. And now this new contender is coming out, you know? It's, yeah. When he's got things from figured past, out, now so something still, to shake him. Yep. Yeah. So it's still like emotional, like the emotional level is still high based on, uh, that he knows this guy from his past and he's got all this other stuff going on and this guy's back to claim his throne because, you know, he's, he's like was locked up for so long watching him, you know, get all the stuff that he should have, all, all that kind of stuff. I, I was like, yes, this is fantastic. I think this is going to be really good. At least the trailer is better than the trailer for Creed 2 and that had all the Rocky mythology going for it and I, I still, you know, as much as I, I thought it was okay, that trailer, I did not get the vibes that I'm getting from this trailer. So unless Warner Brothers marketing team has just done a great job cutting a trailer, yeah. um, right. we'll see. None because, of this is in the movie, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see. And like I said, the, the villain here, at least um, it doesn't seem to have any ties to any previous Rocky universe, which I like as well. So now we're setting off on our own. Uh, very confident looking uh, direction for the franchise. Let's move on to talk about Avatar, The Way of the Water, the long Fight Feature Lake trailer was released before its December release date here, just about a month away from the, the film hitting theaters in the United States. Got our complete look at this film, and the more I see of it, the less intrigued I'm becoming with it. I don't know what that is, because I told you at the beginning, I really enjoyed the first it's Avatar. Be- I saw it two or three times in theaters. because you've seen it. Is that what it is? I just and it doesn't don't... have a story. <clears throat> my, my problem with the first Avatar, I mean, what you described of the first Avatar was... Cool 3D and cool graphics. Well, we've seen that. This is literally the same movie all over again. And the first movie has a terrible story, really. It's not interesting. And I think this story looks even less interesting. And Which it's probably going to show through because I don't think people are going to come out for the spectacle of this because it just doesn't, it, it's not matching that same advancement or leap that the first one had. This one's not matching at all. This just looks like any other shit that, like, that Disney makes. Not only that, it almost was like Valerian, you know, that sequence in the beginning with the whole Valerian and, and all <laughs> yeah. that. So it's just, which was, it was owed a little bit to Avatar itself, but it's not anything that's compelling me to want to go spend three plus hours in the theater with these people. So I, I don't no know. There's no way. I'll watch this at home, but I don't think I can go see this in a theater. I will I, absolutely uh, see the theater, but I just don't, there's not a sense of... Yeah. I don't have the sense of wow on this trailer and I'm waiting for that sense of wow. And maybe that's, what's going to, it's going to need a, a 60 foot screen to do that. But well, it, it maybe might, do you care about any of these characters? Tell me these characters that you love. That no. you care about. What do you hope will happen to them in this movie? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, no, I could care less if they have children. <laughs> no. Even the fact that they have children is kind of bizarre to me and that he's not just some badass military guy any, anymore. Or, uh, and then there's terminators running around. It looks like too. Do you see those robots well, running he, around? I haven't seen the original um, movie in a long time. I don't really remember the ending. He was is the he paraplegic like, soldier, remember? Yeah, I, I understand that. But he's still, that's still him, right? He, this is still just an avatar. Yeah. Or is he, he transferred into it well, now? He'd is have he, to be like in some now? sort of Matrix thing. Where I don't remember, actually. I got to go back and yeah, rewatch exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. So I don't remember how that movie ended. But is, is that still the case in this movie? Is he still just a guy like... A paraplegic? Like plugged into a fucking machine that's, that's, that's operating this Is he just jerking off to VR, thing? basically? Is that what's happening, is that, is that what's what happening here? Like, I mean, is that what's going on in this movie still? Are we still doing that? Because that's not in this trailer, I feel like. So did I not remember? Like, did he get like downloaded into this other body and they fuck, fucking you know, killed him off? Fucking I don't, superhero I'm not storylines sh- I've had to follow since the original <laughs> Avatar. I have no fucking clue anymore. Did Sigourney Weaver die in the first one? I thought so, but then again, isn't she back okay. for this? Uh, is, I uh, yeah, what well, I that's why I'm not an sure. Avatar, I've not Avatar? seen an Avatar in so long. I don't remember it. So, <laughs> well, I, I'm going to rewatch it because uh, I do want to get caught up on it before this this new one, and I I do enjoy well, James we, Cameron's you got films. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll have to watch the first one again before I watch this one because I don't remember it that well. Well, the trailer is out there. It's gotten 10 million views in just a short amount of time. I'm sure it's going to break the record for uh, you know theatrical or trailer views in 24 hours because <laughs> it's. Fucking taken off already. I mean, the numbers on YouTube just keep jumping. All right, the I'll next movie. Let's, let's talk about Burt Kreischer. Do you know who Burt Kreischer is? Are you familiar with Burt Kreischer? The Machine? Mm-hmm. He's the Machine. <laughs> Have you watched his comedy special? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, this would easily be the most famous um, okay. story of his. Right, and so you're you're familiar with that. And this movie was filmed mm-hmm. a couple years ago. It sat on the shelf because it takes place really in Russia and Warner Brothers and Legendary were, were not in the business of releasing a pro-Russian movie in the middle of what was going on 
with their it's war still situation. Going on, yeah, so. still going on. So, but it, they apparently still got to make some money. So they're releasing this movie, <laughs> but it's been on the shelf for quite a while because of it. And I'm surprised because if I that's thought the story they're going with. Yeah, right. I thought that this movie was going to be basically a theatrical retelling of that infamous story about the machine. And but I it think looks, I would have preferred that. I don't know. This is a different take that I'm slightly intrigued is about. It? That it's almost How about like a sequel. throwing up thing. Does that sound good? Oh, don't don't throw up or I'll throw up. Don't throw up or I'll throw up. Oh, then he throws up and puts it in his pocket. I, good I joke. laughed. This will be I a thought, great. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Trevor. I thought that this guy. I thought honestly. I thought the whole time he's the next big movie star in terms of comedy. I thought everything he did scored in this trailer. I don't know what it is, but I I really thought he was funny and it didn't come across to me as gimmicky or any of that shit like Kevin James past stuff has or, you know, you name it from the Sandler guys, including Sandler himself. I really thought that uh, whatever teaser this was, it's only a minute and a half scored with his aspect know. of it. No? I mean, this feels, I don't know. I mean, replace him with Melissa McCarthy and tell me that it would be a different movie. Uh, I mean, honestly, I just thought this was a, or what's in this trailer anyways, is just a non, is just nothing. It's a nothing comedy. It's not going to be worth much of anything again. You know, I'd like to see something a little bit new, um, something original, something interesting. And it wasn't here. It was just another, uh, I'm a fish out of water. Look at me. I don't belong here. Yeah, that's that was true. A whole movie, you know. How many times I, they keep laughed, doing though, this with when these he put the puke in his pocket for later? Put it in his pocket. <laughs> that, that was, was a, a nice touch to that, but uh, what got me was the "don't puke or I'll puke." I, how many times I've heard that? So many times, it's not funny anymore. Stop. No more. A kibosh on that joke. No more. Yeah, no, I get it. I mean, that's that's always the, the you yak all yak thing that's going on for a long time. It just feels However, like such a basic like movie, you know. To put, the put, the teaser know, trailer. Be the jokes. It's got Mark it Hamill in it trailer. as well, playing his Which father. So, yeah, we'll see yeah. how how this develops. I mean, I'm, it might be, you, you know, I, I thought just from the little bit I saw that, and I'm not the biggest Burt Kreischer fan. I mean, I, I enjoy him here and there. I don't really enjoy his stand up, but I enjoy him as a personality. Um, yeah. I thought that he scored with everything he was doing in this teaser for me, at least. So, uh, I, I really enjoyed his presence on this. Let's move on and talk about A Man Called Otto, Tom Hanks' film that's going to be released this Christmas, where he plays a curmudgeon old bastard who is forced to go out into the world and become friends with his neighbors and the people in his community. Uh, Tom Hanks' infinite likability makes him the wrong choice for this role, even from the trailer. Is it me? I don't buy him as the mean old bastard, the Jack Nicholson character, the Clint Eastwood guy. And this story... Has it not been done a, a four or five times previously? Why is this movie even in existence? Is my question. Yeah, so this is a pretty um, bottom of the barrel attempt at um, something. I don't know. I, I get, this really looks Human like something drama? for Tom Hanks. Um, well, well, look, it looks like it works. It looks like it'll be an uplifting movie, uh, and so I, I think this will they'll check all those boxes. But there's nothing special in this movie. It's it's pretty exactly by the book as far as the as you already said the curmudgeonly guy, the guy who who doesn't like anyone but is still a good person, you know, even though he's an asshole. Right, because there's you a know, reason people, for his and people realize, oh, he's an asshole, but. I'll excuse it because he's actually a good guy type of thing. And I think that's basically what this movie's going to be like. And I think Tom Hanks is fine in it. Um, the uh, They've, um, you know, accented the lines in his face to make him look uh, harder, it seems like. I don't know if that's lighting or if that's just he's just with age. But his scowl and stuff that, that he's doing in this, I think, works. I, I think I buy him as, as an angry man. I just think he's such anyways. a likable personality that it's, it's hard general, to take him but, as that. I guess, but yeah, I, I mean, I buy, I think he's, he's fine with this. He seems like an asshole in it. <laughs> Once again, though, a so script I, I or it. at least a concept that looks like it's sell by date was 1996. So I don't understand yeah, I know, exactly. yeah. why this it, is it's being pretty, made now. It looks just, I, I guess the same uh, complaint as I had with the machine uh, you make here. And I, I would agree with that. I think this is just like a really cookie cutter movie, but it's going to check all the marks that it needs to check. And um, so it'll just, it'll exist and. I guess that's fine. <laughs> I don't know what, what else Tom Hanks is supposed to do at this point. You know, I feel like he's just, this is like an easy movie. He probably got to play this asshole guy. And he was like, um, especially when people get older, some people, they go into more of that like family routine. Oh, let me look at Eddie Murphy. Right. Well, I mean, look, and then, he, then they start getting into, into easier movies like this. And, uh, you know, I don't know. 
I mean, Hanks plays a villain of sorts in, in an asshole in Elvis as, as Colonel Parker. I don't know if you watched that at all. Uh-huh. Um, but he's fantastic in that. I mean, the acting in that on both performances is top notch. They both should be nominated. But that's a fantastic performance and a fantastic role for him where he can hide behind makeup and do some interesting acting choices where I thought this was just the kind of stuff that used to come out in the late uh, part of the year it, back in the 90s that would have been a, a, a cleanup success for him at the box office that's a little ditty for him and you know uh, I, mean, I guess so what was the one he I mean he had the one that failed that was basically this Larry but Crown? Uh, was the, it? Larry Crown thank yeah. you which well well I mean that was around the time Will Ferrell had his uh, one with the um he was having the sale the, yeah everything must go whatever the fuck everything must go yes yep yeah it's, they had a lot um, of those arrested so development very similar type movies, things so suppressive they've things all, yeah, and they were obviously very younger. So uh, as you brought up Jack Nicholson, so yeah, this is now we're in this Jack Nicholson phase, and Jack Nicholson did a bunch of this type of shit. Um, so it's not surprising, I guess. I think um, a lot of uh, actors go through this same kind of a phase. Yeah, it's it makes I sense. Know. I mean, that's where they're they're heading towards when they they can't. It's really just easy do to watch. It reminds me of things like the bucket list and stuff, you know. Yeah, uh, but don't or, you miss um, that Hanks never really Schmidt. got back into light comedy. He was so good in the Burbs and Joe versus the Volcano and things like that. <laughs> he never really ever got back into uh, that. Those don't exist anymore, right? Because they're they're all like Ryan Reynolds movies. Um, oh, you're right. Yeah, or someone like that, right? They're very. Um, they're wordy. They're 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 no, like no. Uh, no, you're right. You hit it on the head with Ryan Reynolds because would say Tom Hanks that. in in like, it was if, like if, the Joss Whedon effect, right? They're like the, it's like dialogue, like very like delivery. Um, uh, the delivery is very important for those types of movies. I think now, Tom anyways. Hanks would have crushed Free Guy back in the day. You know, if you could have taken that back in the late '90s, if that was a concept. Actually, back then. he might have he might have done it fine right now <laughs> i mean i see what you're saying actually you say that yeah that would have been a perfect tom hanks movie yeah honestly like a young tom less, hanks and that's less of a character-based movie though even though ryan reynolds plays that out like that which i think is why he's, those roles are going to him or to, uh, someone like melissa mccarthy you know have you i saw the last that melissa mccarthy movie that she just put out on netflix again the very she's playing that a character thanks fucking horrendous but she's playing that character and stuff and it's like uh I guess this is a comedy now. Speaking of Melissa McCarthy, I was watching the original Charlie's Angels movie, the 2001. It was on the other night in some hotel mm-hmm. room. We were falling asleep. It was on. And there's a sequence where they're breaking into uh, some sort of villain's hideout. And there is, uh, this, they're being super rude to this fat lady who's a secretary there. And it's Melissa McCarthy. And I thought, how fucking terrible is that? She had to like... Her big screen debut was just getting made fun of in this blockbuster. And then, you know, years later, she's arguably more famous than all of them. Yeah, she, the, the, the tide has well, turned. that's over. That's already yeah. over. I know, right? That, that came and went in 10 that's years. The, that's the problem with being a comedian, you know? It's yeah, a short like That goes in a wave on. and then you're done. Yeah. I mean, ask Zach Galifianakis how that is. Yeah, oh, yeah, we, ask any of them. Yeah, most of them. Unless, you can, unless, like, Tom Hanks, you can turn that into a... A serious, a serious career something yeah, yeah then uh, then yeah they almost all just disappear all right our next film we're gonna talk about is babylon damien chazelle's new film from um or with margaret Rubba, margaret robbie brad pitt is headlining margaret this I, like Ant- one, yeah. I think antonio banderas there's a bunch of shitload of people yeah, in this olivia movie. wilde's in this eric roberts is in this Samara yeah, I mean, the cast is huge um, toby mcguire's in this uh, hard to make out what this is the log mm-hmm. line is you know the decadence of the 1920s uh, hollywood moving from the silent era to the talkies it's and a all that goes with it film movie about making movies right that's what i had three seen. hours and eight minutes like i said at yeah. the top of the show this this the, is for the, the oscars right as far as i can understand doesn't it look like everybody's doing the same thing? Dude, this is so pretentious. I can't even get by. I don't even know who this fuck this movie's for. Like, I do, don't... Does anyone like movies like like in this way anymore? I, this feels like golden age. Like, I feel like Robert Altman so great to back me. Then. Look at these. Look at the way we act. Huh, we don't give a shit. We live the crazy lives of of the rich and the famous, and we're going to make movies. Well, it felt like an <laughs> Altman-esque right. uh, kind of <coughs> – excuse me. Excuse me. Maybe, oh, but more wild than that. Like it's not as it's not. It doesn't seem smart like ultimate like like his stuff. Would well, be, we know. haven't it seen the movie like yet, a, but it just mm, seems. I'm just tired well, of Margaret Robbie <laughs> playing the you know the coked out, exasperated, you know a Harley Quinn type person. You almost you know like the, I'm. 
you know, I'm so crazy, but like hot and crazy and, and you know, all over well, the fucking place. She can't Brad do that, but Pitt, Brad Pitt can. Being the fucking buffoon. <laughs> I mean, how many times have we seen him as the drunk buffoon already now? Or as like the dope? Like he's redoing <laughs> the I'm bird saying. after reading character. It's, it's stop it. You guys are just... And I don't know what kind yeah, of story supports I three hours and eight minutes. Nonsense. Maybe it's captivating, but what I've seen here, it didn't support three minutes of a trailer. I don't think it's captivating. I think the idea in general is just nonsense. I don't care. I don't even know. I don't understand the idea. It's just a movie about some guys are making a movie, and then they have a lot of parties. No, oh, that's what like, the trailer says. That's the whole says. movie. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't even. Uh, what's well, the they plot hinted darker the things. There are some darker things with coke addiction and, and money being owed and having to get out of town. There are some hints at something else going on. But I mean, on a technical level, the production design, the costumes are probably going to be Oscar worthy. But if the movie itself is, oh, that's sure. going to be it's another a, story. It's a beautiful looking movie, but I, I mean, I you know watch this for three hours <laughs> at home. I'm good. Yeah, I'm not going to, as much as I, I like La 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 Land. Ever, I don't know if I'll watch this. La La Land's fantastic. Did you watch First Man? His follow up uh, with Ryan not. Gosling? I didn't care about it, so I never I liked watched it. it. I really liked it, honestly. Yeah. I gotta recommend that. That's what that movie mm. and Only the Brave snuck by me initially, and I caught up with both I of them and really I've enjoyed not both seen of them. Only the Brave either. And it's another good one. Another good one. No, I have to, there are some movies I have to just uh, not watch. Okay. <laughs> There's got to be some, right? All right. Well, he decided, and that's what's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I can't keep getting recommendations from, <laughs> from everybody. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, watch this show now. You're like, fuck, there goes a week. I'm like, uh, God damn it. I was hoping that was so bad I wouldn't have to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Our last trailer on tonight's show is A Christmas Story Christmas, the HBO Max follow up to 1983's Christmas Story, that beloved classic that's on television every year. This is a legacy sequel bringing back the original cast and the majority of the original cast at least to reprise their roles and this is problematic for a few reasons. One is that A Christmas Story 2 it already exists where Daniel Stern plays the father fairly well directed by Bryant Levant came out in 2012 and it's actually not bad as a true sequel to A Christmas Story if that's what you want. This movie is going to be uh, basically a nostalgic throwback to try to get mm-hmm. our Member generation yeah. to, to watch it. And I think just from the... This looks just, terrible. It looks forgettable already just from the oh, trailer. God, this when is it bad. set? Because the original set like, in 1955. Is this the 70s? Is this the yeah. 80s? What is this? It, it looks like that Home Alone re- the, the fucking movie they tried to put out not long ago. This is a cash grab through and through and it looks horrendous. Like, it's I w- so I bad that HBO this. would not, you know, HBO took back some films that they're going to release on HBO Max and now are putting them in theaters. House Party is one of them, and I saw the trailer for that the other day. Don't know about that, how that's going to do, but at least they had the balls to put it in the theaters. <laughs> this, they said, fuck it, this turkey's not going out in theaters. This is going to be, you know, everyone's going to watch it because of the nostalgia factor, and it's going to be forgotten in three days. This is, I can <sighs> tell you right now. I mean, does anybody want to look at Ralph Billingsley? I, I mean, do you want to look at Ralphie at this no, age? These people are ugly now. I hate to say ugly, but they're just, it's not pleasant to revisit a character because you know you're going to be watching the original at least three times as it's on throughout the fucking holidays. It's going to be on the background. And you're, you, know, you know what Ralphie looks like and you're used to seeing it. And now you want to see one where his dad's dead and Ralphie's in his 40s and hates the world or is depressed about this and that. In and his get 40s? He looks like he's in his 70s, but I mean... Yeah, he's got to be older than that. I think he's playing younger, though, in this film, because it looks like it's set in the 60s or 70s. I mean, because that... He looks old as shit. Regardless, the trailer looks terrible, right? Yeah, there's nothing in this movie that I would imagine would be funny or worthwhile watching. Um, And even in this trailer, watch the trailer. It's member berries. Remember in A Christmas Story when this happened? Hey, Ralph, remember this? Remember that? The whole fucking... The whole trailer is predicated on that, so this movie will be a completely pointless watch if you do watch it the one that you know like i said original a christmas story 2 is gets a bum rap because it's the no one can make a sequel to a christmas story okay well now you got the legacy people back and you think this is gonna cut it i mean if you really want a true sequel watch the one that came out 10 years ago it's not bad for what it is it really is. It's Daniel not, Stern it's not a, a great movie, but it's, it's not. Fine. But Daniel Stern does a great job as the old man. I got to mm-hmm. be honest. And the yeah. kid who plays the main role does a good Ralphie impersonation. It's it's got a certain vibe to it. I mean, it's got a lot of things going for. It. I really enjoyed a oh, Christmas well, it story. Feels too. like exactly what it is. But at least it's not. Um, it's not a cash grab. It, it's well, it is, but it is. <laughs> 
it's uh, it's, it's not, not as a, bad as this. It one. doesn't feel as blatant. Like they they, they as this try one. to make it its own movie at least. Yes, they try to tell a story within the world as opposed to saying, let's retell the same fucking story with old people. And yeah. like you said, remember this? That was fun. Hey, guys, remember when we did that before? That was cool, too. Yeah. Fuck off. Such, it's, <laughs> it, looks, it made me cynical watching it. It really did. It's not it like does. I didn't want to enjoy it. It's so bad. It's like, you, you, you're going to like this because you like the first one, right? You're going to like this one. Hey, can, can you just, watch, just look at this. Remember the first one? That, well, look what happens in this one. Yeah, it it's like must the first be one. hard. Remember that? Like, it oh truly God. must be hard to make a memorable Christmas movie. It really must be because the fucking two that are shown constantly still is National Lampoon's and Christmas Story. And those are both from the 80s. I mean, we, we've been 40 fucking years and we can't get... Well, a decent I mean, Christmas movie? Uh, the, the obviously the king of them all. What, Elf? <laughs> Fuck. I didn't even like Elf in the theaters. No, I still don't understand that no. movie. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. I mean, come on. Is anybody in our... I mean, when was the last time anybody gave a shit and watched It's a Wonderful Life? Are, are you serious? If you well, watch It's a Wonderful of Life... still watch it. Oh, that's like saying they watch Gone with the Wind and Harvey nobody's watching that people say they watch it's a wonderful life because they're like oh it's fucking on and it's you know people watch christmas story and watch a wonderful life they're only in your early 40s my friend there are plenty <laughs> of people 20 years older than you they're still watching that shit so yeah well, i think that's still a good one and in a good example of something that that's so old and that nothing has been has replaced it you know i mean i'll give you for our generation and less um yeah that'll fade out and it will be the others, but those two will fade out. I mean, maybe, yeah. they're, they're relatively old as well. Um, it's, it's not a matter of maybe. People like, if you watch what the kids are watching now, uh, yeah, I, the whole future's fucked. <laughs> yeah, it's TikTok. <laughs> it, it's nonsense, just like crap stuff, because compared to what, uh, you know, and I'm talking quality-wise, like story quality-wise, they just shit stuff out, and people watch it, so I don't know. Well, this is going to be available on HBO Max come Christmas time. I think December 23rd is the official release date, so you can watch it for yourself. Last year, we were given 8-Bit Christmas on HBO Max, which itself was kind of a 1980s version of a Christmas story, which I thought was, um, yeah, I don't know, a somewhat desperate attempt yeah. to, to be. <laughs> it was uh, not that great. <laughs> no, but, I mean, it might be better than this from the looks of it. So I think it will be, actually. <laughs> Sad to say. But I'm still never watching that movie again. Me neither. And once again, more forgettable content on a streaming yeah. service. Who'd have thought? There's plenty of, of, of good Christmas movies to watch. Um, I mean, Surviving Absolutely. Christmas. Let's That's see. the one that gets overlooked, and I watch it every fucking year. Um, it's 88 minutes long. Do yourself a favor and check it out. Just Friends is technically a Christmas movie. Yeah, I agree with you on that, too. That is technically a Christmas movie <laughs> um, uh, and I a fun one. Other, there, there are plenty of others. You know. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jingle All the Way, you got in there and things like there that, too. There's another so. one. That's why I'm saying. There's plenty of them. You can get a good lineup going. I'm talking about of, ones uh, that are show Christmas no. Movies without having to watch. Perennially. Uh, oh, right. I, I understand Dr. that. Dr. Seuss's, well, um, the Jim Carrey one. Ones is, that is, everyone's going to uh, gonna say. Yeah. The ones that... The, the ones that uh, everyone's uh, top 10 list of Christmas movies is going to be. Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Cause they just, they just, done. I actually forgot that they did watches. that home alone reboot last year. That terrible fucking thing. Yeah, that was really bad. That was bad. That was worse than home alone three, the theatrical one. Mm -hmm. It really was. Cause I saw that not that long ago and thought, look, this is better than the fucking reboot they had going on. And if we watched it last Christmas, Regardless, that's going to wrap up our show tonight. We got you guys an extra bonus long show for you. Two shows for the price of one. It's been a while since we had a conversation, but it's good to be back in the saddle again. Got a lot of stuff to go over in the future with you, too. Keep an eye out for a future podcast. We'll be discussing some television pilots, getting back on that. The pilot for Coming to America and Clerks. We'll also be discussing the latest in movies and movie trailers, like we always do. Speaking for Trevor Anderson, I am Jason Rugard, and we are the Movie Mavericks. Oh my, another magnificent episode has come to an end. If you're craving more, set your destination to moviemavericks.com, warp 9. Engage! <laughs> <laughs>